Good evening, I am Trinae Striggs, the chair of the school board of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6.06 p.m. on this 22nd day of August, 2023. Thank you to those who have joined us in person and online. Madam Clerk, will you please announce those school board members in attendance? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in the Holland Road Annex School Board Room is Chair Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Brown, Mr. Callan, Mr. Culpepper, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Manning, and Ms. Melnick. Okay, and uh, note that Dr. Robertson is attending tonight's meeting as the superintendent's designee. He will be, from here on out, our designee um, sitting, acting superintendent, okay? Um, Ms. Owens will be here in a few minutes. She had to take care of some business really quickly and she'll be right back. Um, and Ms. Martin um, is absent tonight because she is attending the U.S. Travel Conference in Georgia this week for her full-time job. She may not be able to call in, but we'll try to do so after um, our conference closing session this evening. Okay. So we're going to start with a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in observing a 60-second moment of silence. Please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So there are no um, student or employee public awards and recognitions tonight. Um, so we're going to go forward with adopting the agenda. Are there any modifications to the agenda as presented? Yeah. I have one, and I want to add under information according to bylaw 128, a uh, recommendation to fill the vacant at-large government governance seat by Kathleen Brown and also I want to add that to action tonight to vote on because we are, will be having our next governance meeting the sept in September 6th before our next school board meeting so we need to go ahead and get her um, acclimated and on our on that uh, committee so we're adding that for information and also action tonight and that is a motion Second. and seconded by Mrs. Weems to approve that agenda as presented and modified. Do you clarify that modification for me, please? I didn't hear it. Sir? Do you clarify that modification for me, please? I just didn't hear it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we talked about it in, clo in our um, admin. admin recommendations, and so I'll, I'll up-to-date you on that. Um, we have an open seat for the governance committee because there's a fifth at-large seat. Um, and when, when the um, PRC met and uh, voted on a new chair, it, it became, um, it emptied this, that seat for at-large on the governance because the chair for the PRC was that fifth seat, Mrs. Owens. Understood. So that is open now. So, and Ms. Brown said she would be more than happy to take that for us. Madam Chair, I think that means you would amend the agenda to add um, information item 12C would be discussion or introducing the addition to the governance committee of the at-large member, uh, me, Mrs. Brown, and then you would move to action, which would be 15C would be the vote on approving Mrs. Brown as the at-large member of the governance. Okay, so does everybody, 
want to put that on their agenda, please. So 12C and 15C. And the motion has been made and seconded and in, in all in favor of that, of adopting the agenda. I don't know if we vote, actually voted on that. Please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have nine ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. So that brings us to our um, superintendent's report. This is our second meeting of the month. So this is uh, the report and recognitions. Dr. Robertson, we look forward to your report and recognitions. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. Here are a few items of interest for you and our families. One of our esteemed educators is a finalist for National Secondary School Principal of the Year. Ms. Sham Bevel is one of three finalists for the 2024 National Principal of the Year Award. The president of the National Association of Secondary School Principals said he was impressed with how Ms. Bevels collaborates with her staff at Bayside Sixth Grade Campus to engage with families and community members and to support teaching and learning. She exemplifies the very best of our profession. You may recall that earlier this year, Ms. Bevel was named the Outstanding Middle School Principal of Virginia. Since 2021, she has been cultivating a welcoming, inclusive, and affirming environment at Bayside Sixth Grade Campus with a clear version and vision that every student in our Title I school reads at or above proficiency and identifies a career or post-secondary interest. We'll find out in October if Ms. Bevel wins the National Award as the Principal of the Year event in Washington, D.C. We certainly wish her well and her school community the best. We are certainly blessed in Virginia Beach City Public Schools to have 85 other dynamic and exceptional principals leading our 86 schools and centers. Their extraordinary efforts over the past three years have resulted in student achievement performance that far exceeds the state during a time of uncompromising change. They have attracted and retained a strong teaching staff, created a, self, a safe and welcoming environment for staff, students and families, and served as a bedrock in each community. I ask that everyone join me this year in thanking your principal for his or her leadership efforts. And I'd like to congratulate Ms. Pavel. Next, I'd like to share a video about our community mentorship program. You'll see in these clips how our mentors and students from Parkway and Green Run Elementary Schools truly benefit from this program. Let's take a look. The program is the, uh, it used to be called the SeaTac Mentoring Program. It started back in 1999 with back then Chief Judge Shad uh, Shadrick and uh, Judge Timothy Quick from uh, the Juvenile Domestic Relations Court uh, started picking it back up and now we do Parkway Elementary School and Greenland Elementary School. We mentor third graders and we go visit the student at their school for a certain amount of time and we get to interact with them, let them know what we do. The research shows that uh, um, the biggest impact we can have on kids is in third grade. The kids love it. They get to get pulled out of class whenever the mentor shows up. They get to leave class, go to the library, go to the gym, whatever the mentor and mentee want to do, hang out, talk, read, whatever the case may be. Uh, we try to you know, be a positive uh, influence in their lives. Well, the cool stuff I did was when my mentor brought me to Chick-fil-A and she had also brought me a lot of art stuff so I can draw stuff. I learned a few things, how to play chess and checkers and ever since I've gotten really good at it, I beat my mentor one or two times. There, there, there's been studies for third graders that um, 
show that at that time frame, at the time of their life, they are very impressionable. So if we can bridge that gap by showing that uh, people in law enforcement, attorneys as well, that we're human and that we care about them, that goes a long way with them, uh, with what their perception is of us as they get older. Maybe I want to be a police officer or a judge one day. This year has been awesome to see new people get involved. We got a group of new deputies that have been getting involved and a lot of folks that are just getting introduced to it. Two mentors, wow. It, it's a great opportunity for kids to see you know, uh, what the opportunities are in the community. They talk to people that are in the business community, they're in the uh, legal community, so they learn and get a lot of options and, and learn at an early age. So yeah, it would be awesome to go into a lot more schools. Beach Bar Association, the Sheriff's Department, the Police Department, and the lead mentor, Judge Tim Quick, for making this program that supports student well-being, enhances real-world learning, and broaden opportunities for career exploration and experience. More than 6,000 community members filled the Virginia Beach Convention Center on August 12th for the Back to School Care Fair. It was by far the biggest and most successful care fair in the event's three-year history. We received a lot of positive local news coverage of students and parents finding out more about community resources while having fun posing in front of a monster fire truck, running through a lacrosse obstacle course, and building towers out of spaghetti noodles and marshmallows. Our community partners and Virginia Beach City Public Schools volunteers helped distribute and donate 3,500 backpacks, 200 haircuts, 200 dental screenings, 283 vision screenings, 95 physicals, and 1,500 bags of non-perishable food. This event really brought the community together while helping families, and I'd like to thank everyone involved, especially the Office of Family and Community Engagement, which organized the event. In addition to the Care Fair, the Aid Now charity recently held its annual Jumpstart event with us at Corporate Landing Middle School for families who are experiencing homelessness. About 500 students received backpacks, hygiene kits, school supplies, haircuts, vision screenings, and other resources. The community continues to come together to help all students have a successful start to the school year. We're looking forward to the first day of school, August the 28th. Our shorter summer break hasn't stopped us from preparing to welcome students in a number of ways. Last week, we held our new educator orientation program for teachers, specialists, speech language pathologists, and counselors. Our new staff members received tips on everything from how to have successful phone calls with parents to how to use digital platforms to engage students with learning experiences. Cafeteria managers are preparing new from scratch dishes for the school, new school year. More than 100 food service professionals recently met at Green Run High School to prepare the new menu items, taste them, and exchange ideas. We continue to prepare this week to welcome back students next week. Thanks to a lot of hard work by our staff, our parents, and our community, I'm sure this school year will be one of the best ever. Thank you, Madam Chair. This concludes the Superintendent's Report. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. I also have some recognition. Yes, you do. So uh, tonight we're going to do some recognitions for members who were promoted and recognized in the previous board meetings. We'll start with Dr. Michaela Cardwell. You could ask her to stand. <clears throat> Dr. Cardwell was recently an assistant principal at North Landing Elementary School, and prior to that she was an instructional specialist in the Office of Programs for Exceptional Children. Before that, she was a teacher for a number of years, and we're happy that you've approved of our recommendation for her to be the new principal at Windsor Woods Elementary School. And Dr. Carwell, I recognize you have some guests with us. Thank you, Dr. Carwell. Next up, we have Ramona Harps. Ms. Harps most recently served as an administrative assistant at Birdneck Elementary School, and prior to that, she was a teacher for 
30 years at Lincoln Park Elementary School. We're pleased that you rec approved of our recommendation for her to be a new assistant principal at W.T. Cook Elementary School. Ms. Harps, I understand you have guests. Congratulations. Next up, we have Nicole Karras. Nicole was, was, was previously assistant principal at Red Mill Elementary School, and prior to that, she was a teacher for 16 years. Uh, we're, pre I'm sorry, we're pleased that you've accepted our recommendation for Nicole to be the next principal at Thalia Elementary School. Congratulations, Nicole, and I understand you have guests. Congratulations. Next up, we have Molly Lewis. Molly Lewis was previously an assistant principal at Ocean Lakes Elementary School. Prior to that, she was a coordinator in the elementary curriculum department of teaching and learning. She was an instructional specialist uh, as, as well as a teacher for a number of years. And we're pleased that you've approved that Molly would become the next principal at Windsor Oaks Elementary School. Molly, I see you have guests. That's outstanding. Next up, we have Shalice Miller. Shalice was previously an administrative assistant at College Park and Diamond Strings Elementary School. Prior to that, she was a professional learning specialist in the Office of Professional Growth and Innovation, and prior to that, she was a longtime teacher. And we're pleased that you have approved her recommendation to be the next assistant principal at Creed's Elementary School. And Shalice, you see I have guests. Congratulations. Next up, we have Angela Norell. Previously, Angela was an administrative assistant at Brookwood and SeaTac, and prior to that, she was a longtime teacher in our division as well as outside of our division. And we're pleased that you've provided, approved of our recommendation for her to be a next assistant principal at Point of View Elementary School. And I believe you have guests. Thank you. And then finally, uh, Dr. Eugene Saltner. Um, we, we brought him back, yes. Dr. Saltner has served in a number of roles in the division. A couple years ago, he was our chief schools officer, and prior to that, he was a longtime principal and mentor to many principals that work in Virginia Beach and outside of Virginia Beach. And we're pleased that you've approved of our recommendation for him to be the next chief of staff and the office of superintendent, Dr. Saltner. So, uh, Madam Chair, I would offer one more remark. A thank you to the families. Uh, I really appreciate the number of you that, sh that showed up tonight to support our new uh, administrators. Um, they'll often have long nights, and they'll need to come home and, and get a big hug. Okay, uh, you hear that, the Miller boys? All right. You make sure you take care of Mama now. All right. That's going to be important. So thank you very much for coming out, Madam Chair. That's it. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. We're, we're looking forward to working with all of you in your new capacity. Okay, okay so we are, we're now going to the approval of our meeting minutes for August um, the 8th, 2023, our regular school board meeting. Are there any modifications to the August 8th, 2023 school board meeting minutes as presented? Hearing none, I call for a motion to approve the August 8th, 2023 minutes as presented. To have a motion, Ms. Anderson and second, Mr. Callan. All in favor, please raise your hands. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. 
So we're now on 11 public comments until 8 o'clock p.m. The school board will now hear public comments on matters relevant to pre-K through 12 public education in Virginia Beach and the business of the school board and the school division from citizens and delegations who signed up with the school board clerk prior to noon today. The purpose for the public comment section of the school board agenda is for the school board to offer an orderly forum to receive public comments during the school board meeting. Members of the public have the opportunity to provide comments during the meeting by signing up to speak from the podium. Other methods of public comment are not offered during the school board meeting. As a reminder to persons in attendance at tonight's meeting, school board meeting decorum guidelines prohibit disruption of the meeting through disruptive clapping, calling by audience members, holding signs that interfere with the audience members' ability to view the meeting or otherwise take in action to communicate with the school board or disrupt the meeting. And I'd like to remind everyone attending tonight's meeting, this is includes all of us that are on the stage and those in the audience and online, to please speak with respect and kindness tonight. I appreciate that. Speakers are responsible for being in the school board room auditorium or online when they are called to speak. When a per person's speaker's name is called, the speaker should line up in the aisle to wait for their turn at the podium so as to efficiently have speakers address the school board. Speakers lined up for their turn at the podium may take a seat near the podium to wait for their turn to speak. If a speaker is not present when called to speak, or is not online or unable to unmute when called to speak, the school board at its sole discretion may allow the speaker to speak at the end of the public comment session. The school board also invites the public to submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. Madam Clerk, can you please introduce the first speaker? Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first speakers are Jana Saltesiak, AJ Quartetero, and Bradley Fish. First, as the first speaker, I want to ask everyone who comes after me, maybe say how you're connected to the schools. Like, when making decisions like this, where there's mentions of parents' rights, it's good to know who's a parent of a current student, or who is a current student, who just graduated, or if someone's homeschooled or goes to a private school, if they are a voter in Virginia on Beach. With that being said, I will begin my speech. Hello everyone, my name is Jana Saltesiak and I am a senior at Kellum High School. Many of you here might recognize me and tonight I'm here to oppose the new suggested policies that would put many of my transgender peers at risk. Gender affirming surgeries have a regret rate of 1%. If any of our surgery had that low of a regret rate, we would call it a miracle. For comparison, hip replacement surgeries have regret rates anywhere between 6 and 30%. That's a drastic change when compared to gender affirming surgeries and treatment. There are people that claim being transgender is a mental disorder, but it isn't. Research has shown that the stress and dysphoria felt by transgender people isn't due to their mental health. It's because of how they're treated by society, pressures and abuse that they have to navigate. A 2018 study in tech, Austin, Texas found that by simply using someone's preferred name, you can reduce the risks of suicide. And then there's a survey by the Trevor Project. When kids felt safe and their schools, safe to be who they are, to be identified by their current pronouns and name, their risk of suicide was greatly reduced. So as we talk about these policies, let's keep let these things in mind. Let's remember that these decisions affect real lives. And let's work for creating an environment where we all feel valued and supported. Please. Listen to me and my fellow students who will be affected by this decision. Those that oppose us talk about parents' rights to know, but what about our right to choose when? Thank you for listening. Vote against these new policies and have a great night. Our next speaker is AJ Quartero, Bradley Fish, and Fabrizio Solis. Good evening. My name is AJ Cordero. my pronouns are they, them, and I am a rising junior at Kellum High School. There are six days until school starts again. 
six days until summer is over and I will officially be in my junior year of high school. New classes are an anxiety-inducing part of the first days of school experience for everybody, but for me, this change of pace is especially difficult. I always feel completely and utterly embarrassed as my new, well-meaning teachers call out a name that isn't mine. I am always mortified because, thanks to the attendance sheet, every other student in the room now knows that name. When I indicate my preferred name, I get to watch the sneers and listen to the comments whispered by peers who catch on to the fact that I am transgender. So unfortunately, I'm not too excited for those first days of school. But instead of being with my friends and family, savoring my last days of summer, I am standing here at this podium protesting policies that revoke my basic rights, listening to adults who claim to want to protect children calling teenagers a social contagion. The 2023 policies are not an effort made in good faith. They are pieces of anti-trans rhetoric cobbled together in one contradictory statement. The 2023 model policies do not serve the needs of all students, as they claim to. They do not put forth effort to make transgender students feel respected. They create issues for transgender students that cisgender students are not subject to. And if that's not discrimination, I don't know what is. Having transgender students jump through hoops in order to receive basic respect, that which cisgender students receive automatically, is ridiculous and discriminatory. Additionally, the means of which each of these policies will be implemented, which is vital to ensure educator understanding of the policies, are barely touched on. How immediately and under what conditions will teachers and counselors be forced to out a transgender student to their parents? How explicitly would a student have to indicate their identity? Furthermore, the teachers and counselors that are required to out trans students will be placed under immense stress. Forced outing will result in a decline in the well-being of trans students whether that is due to abuse or neglect in their home or feelings of paranoia and a lack of safety demonstrated by the forced outing in question. How can you expect teachers and counselors to be comfortable with being responsible for that? The short answer is they won't be. You will lose teachers. Is erasing transgender and non-binary students from your school system really worth that risk? 30 seconds. You cannot expect us as students to be able to learn and thrive in a place where it is mandatory that we are disrespected. We are not asking for much. We are not asking for extra attention or even your full understanding of our identities. We are only asking for respect, for safety, and for equity. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bradley Fish, Fabrizio Solis, and then Bethany Wilmoth. Good afternoon, board members. I would like to discuss the various legal issues surrounding the 2023 model policies, the expenses that would need to be paid out if they are enacted, and the ways it infringes on the rights of transgender students. As stated within Section 6, A2, the quote, 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution guarantees persons within the jurisdiction of any U.S. state equal protection of the laws, including protecting students and under other individuals from invidious discrimination, end quote. This is found within the 2023 model policies themselves. The fact is that Section 2 contains details that, if enacted, would break the 14th Amendment. The requirement of students to need parental consent to use different names or pronouns is discriminatory. Nicknames, such as Tommy from Tom, are respected with no parental consent required. However, what if someone named Mackenzie goes by Mac? This original name has a more female connotation, but the shortening has a more male connotation. If nicknames are allowed, then Mac is certainly still a nickname, even if the gender commonly associated with it has changed around it. This is just one instance where the policies are unclear and unfit for Virginia Beach schools. The policies also identify terminology that is wholly false and dishonest. It identifies a transgender student as, quote, a public school student whose parent has stated in writing that the student's gender differs from the student's sex, end quote. This is simply not true. By identifying a transgender student in this manner, these policies are erasing an entire group of people from the books. Not to mention the non-binary community, which these policies would also be affecting. Both of these communities have, been have not been respected or asked about whether or not these policies are good for their groups, because we all know what that they would respond with no. Arguably, the biggest issue in regards to potential lawsuits Last meeting, Ms. Lene discussed some, of, discussed some of the legal concerns for these policies. I would like each of the board members to imagine the headache these policies would cause. All it takes is one big lawsuit to make the policy seem even less approachable. 
regardless of your own personal opinions on the policies themselves. Our school district is fortunate enough to have a lawyer on hand, and we should be understanding of how many legal woes will exist if these pass. Please, use the resources available and modify the policies so that our school district isn't inundated with legal battles and all of the complications that arise. Legal battles that will be using tax dollars to fight. 30 seconds. If you think the pushback of the policies is high, imagine the response when you start bringing money into play. We need to be practical about this, and the model policies are just not practical. Do not allow these model policies to promote discrimination and chaos throughout our schools, and do not reject Virginian law. Thank you. Our next speaker is Fabrizio Solis, Bethany Wilmoth, and then Kyleen Bond. Good evening. My name is Fabrizio Solis, and I'm a rising junior at Kellum High School. I've come today to advocate for my peers and their safety and comfort at school. The model policies proposed by Governor Yunkin seem to ignore the comfort and more importantly, the safety of trans students here in Virginia, and they should be heavily modified. At school, countless things can feel unsafe for all students, and it's the staff's responsibility to make students feel comfortable in their environment. As the model policies themselves state, school shall serve the needs of all students. Trans students should be included in that. They shouldn't have to be worried about being outed to their parents by their teachers and counselors before they are ready. And it is not a teacher's place to report the way a student identifies. There are countless reasons why a student may not be ready to reveal their identity to their parents. And these policies enforce that teachers should try to intervene through counselors, putting more unnecessary burden on teachers. These model policies are unnecessary and discriminatory and reinforce the idea that queer youth do not have a place in our schools. They potentially conflict with the Virginia Human Rights Act which prohibits the government from unlawful discrimination on the basics of sex or gender identity. Cisgender students may, be, uh, may go by any nickname they'd like without being reported to a counselor, yet trans students must have theirs approved by their parents. This places transgender students under a magnifying glass, one that their cisgender peers don't have to abide by, and one that unfairly scrutinizes them and places them in harm's way. While many families may be supportive, it is a fact that many queer students report not feeling supported at home. It's not the school's job to decide when, if ever, a student should come out to their parents, nor should it be the responsibility to investigate the student's gender identity. Another issue with the model policies is that they address all age groups with the same procedure and treat them as if they have no sovereignty or agency. Students as young as 14 have various medical rights, can work jobs, contribute to society, and function independently of their parents. Several of my friends can drive a car, a, multi a multiple ton machine that gives people total freedom of movement but can't go by the name they want to without their parents' permission. Students also use their preferred names and means of address at work, which they can do without the consent of their parents at the age of 16. The model policies, with their potential violation of the Virginia Human Rights Act, can also own a, open up VBCVS to lawsuits, which would be costly and unnecessary. Even if VBCVS wins said lawsuits, it's even more unnecessary considering that the current policies work much better in regard to transgender students. I sincerely hope that you reject these model policies. All over the country, policies like these are being implemented and they are unhelpful 30 seconds. and harmful. I don't want that to happen in the community that I live in, and I don't want my queer friends to live in a place like that. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Bethany Wilmoth, then Kyleen Bond, then Eden Amato. Good evening, my name is Bethany Wilmoth. I'm a rising sophomore at Salem High School and I'm here to speak against falling through with the 2023 model policies. It's been nearly a year since a small group of us have been attending these meetings. The majority of our speakers are people who these policies directly impact. People who have, had their, who, people who have been closeted and know what it's like to be afraid of how others will react. People who have had their identity spat on and disrespected people who have dealt with and experienced hatred due to who they are and people who have felt unsafe in their bodies. None of these people, none of these groups, were consulted whatsoever by Governor Youngkin before introducing these policies. Even after the pushback coming from students all around the state, the model policies were essentially not changed, despite suggestions from transgender students and their parents that they do otherwise. As of right now, there is a, there is a petition entitled Stop Virginia's New Policy Persecuting Trans Kids. It currently has well over 15,000 signatures. 
And that's only a fraction of people whose voice you would be directly ignoring by implementing these policies. These policies are highly flawed, to say the least. Youngkin's policies leave many questions unanswered, and with all due respect, Mrs. Manning's resolution fails to clear any of them up. I've really briefly mentioned the lack of conversation between Youngkin and corresponding groups regarding these policies, although they aren't the only groups who have had their voices ignored in this decision. Were teachers and counselors remotely considered in this decision either? These policies add an entirely new responsibility to their jobs, a responsibility that directly allows them to intrude on personal familial relationships and conversations. How can you argue that Virginia schools are already being overbearing and ought to solve said issue by just furthering a school's control over its staff and students? If your true goal is to protect every student board, you must acknowledge the students who simply want to feel secure in school when they may not have the same privileges at home. The only reason these policies have any sort of ground on these floors is due to fear mongering that has possessed our country for far too long. Regardless of your personal opinions on these policies, it has to be said that these decisions are being rushed. It has to be said that a severe number of people involved in our school system, whether it be students or staff, were hardly contacted or even considered in these decisions. These policies and the process of implementation is a headache waiting to happen for every party involved. 30 seconds. These model policies are heavily flawed, and so is Ms. Manning's resolution. Further discussion is needed regarding how these will impact the culture in our schools, the relationship between students and teachers, and how these policies will, will be implemented effectively. Please don't rush into this decision and reject the immediate implementation of these policies. Take the time to review these policies and establish something that would be beneficial to our schools. Thank you. Um, could I ask people, um, we asked before to please be ready to speak. So if you could come up, the next three people, if you don't want to stand in line in the aisle, just sit up at close to the podium so it doesn't take as long to get up because we're waiting and that takes more time away from other speakers. So I'm asking you, if you know that you're next, the next three people, please come and sit close to the podium. And that goes from here on out to the end of our speakers at 8 o'clock. Thank you. Our next speakers are Kyleen Bond, Eden Amato, and then Shaylee Harlatcher. Good evening, I'm Kyleen Bond. I'm a rising senior at uh, Floyd E. Kellum High School. Usually my speeches are thought out. I spend hours upon hours trying to find just the right wording of how to get my message across that these policies mean a lot to us students. They're harmful and subject children to being discriminated against in an environment they should feel welcomed in. My friend's body was found dead yesterday morning and I still chose to come to this meeting, even filled with all the grief I had finding out that information because these policies mean just that much to me because I can't stomach another phone call that someone I love is gone. It's, it's real that these policies will affect students' mental health. Um, I don't even need a speech for it at that point. It'll, it'll affect them, it really will. And I don't think you realize how much these other kids relentlessly will pick on you once they find out that you use a different name. How many times I've heard a teacher purposely misname students that are trans in the past and just how harmful it can really be. And we all stand here, all of us, and we preach to you week after week, meeting after meeting, how much that this all means to us and how we just want a basic right. And I'm not even trans, but I stand with my friends and I don't wanna see them go. And I'm tired of the phone calls that they're in mental hospitals or the amount of students that I've met in mental hospitals that are trans and are there because they don't feel supported in their homes. Yes, you as a parent might support your kid if they're trans, but that doesn't mean that other parents are going to. And sure, you can't umbrella them and say, oh, well, you can't subject to that all parents are gonna be abusive, but we need to put the precaution there for the students that are going to be put in those households because they deserve to be protected. We can't, you can't just leave them out because you don't wanna hurt another parent's feelings because they don't wanna be labeled that they could be abusive. The point is we want to protect all of our students no matter what, and they deserve that right. Thank you.
Our next speaker is Eden Amato, Shaley Harlatcher, and then Vivian Duchat. Eden Amato, Shaylee Harlatcher. Hello everyone, my name is Shaylee Harlacher. I am 15 going into my sophomore year at Kellum High School. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Today I stand before you to shed a light on a matter of utmost important, the imperative need to decline the 2023 model policies that have the potential to cause irrep irreparable harm to our schools and most vulnerable among us. These policies under the guise of fairness and equality possess deeply troubling flaws that we must address. Firstly, in section D of the guiding principles, it is stated that all schools shall respect all students. However, when you have a closer look except at section D3, under the identification of students, it reveals a perplexing contradiction. It states that personnel shall refer to students using only the pronouns appropriate to the sex appe appearing on the student's official record. This is not only disregarding the fundamental principles of respect, but it also misgenders and dead names students, which is considered discrimination by the American Psychological Association. It is vital that these policies align with our values of inclusivity and respect. Secondly, these policies' selective ap approach to, to information sharing is troubling. As students grow older, they are given different rights and freedoms, such as the right to privacy. As an example, schools are not even allowed nor required to disclose a teenage student's pregnancy to their parents. This prompts a crucial question. Why is this expected that we inform parents about a student being transgender while ignoring a person's boundaries and potentially violating their privacy while something that is arguably more life-changing to a student's life, such as pregnancy, is not held under the same expectation? Equality demands consistency, not discrimination by omission. Our society has a long way to go when it comes to the acceptance and understanding of the LGBTQIA community. Shockingly, 67% of the LGBTQIA community youth hear their own family members making negative comments about other LGBTQIA people. The statistics do not end there. 40% of homeless individuals identify as LGBTQIA+, underscoring the stark reality that many homes are not safe for these individuals. These policies should be promoting an understanding, promoting understanding and support, not exas exacerbating the challenges they already face. 30 seconds. In conclusion, we must recognize that the 2023 model policies, well, while well intended, fall short of their objectives. They, de they dis create prosperities violate individual anatomy, and in some, instance, in some instances, exacerbate discrimination. Thank you for your time. Our next speakers are Vivian Duchette, Geneva Warren, and Alana Spencer. Greetings, members of the board. My name is Rose Duchette. I am 17 years old, a high school senior at Kellum. I have a driver's license, I pay state and federal taxes, and I have been certified in first responder training necessary for my job. According to Virginia Code 54.1-2969, I can consent to my own medical treatment in cases of birth control and pregnancy services, substance abuse treatment, and mental health treatment, as well as having power over the disclosure of my medical records in all cases. In one year, I will be voting. I've always been careful about my studying, as the school system has taught me. How I select my preferred candidate employs many of the studying skills I've learned during my years in the district. I make a list of topics that concern me. I research the candidate's prior stances on policy involving those topics. I write it all down, watch speeches, watch meetings, research and research and research. It's possible I'm a bit more thorough than the average voter, but most people do some form of investigation before voting. According to a recent PBS poll, two out of every three voters are against laws limiting transgender rights. The model policies can certainly be described as limiting transgender rights. Do you really want to risk further alienating an already concerned voter base this close to election season? As a soon-to-be voter, I see major holes in the Yunkin model policies. 
Many secondary schools are scheduled to be rebuilt within the near future, and it's entirely possible that future governors may overturn the 2023 policies. I don't want my taxpayer dollars to be wasted building unnecessary gender-neutral restrooms, as is required in the model policies. Additionally, how will these policies be enforced? Our schools are already incredibly understaffed. The schedules are in shambles. Teachers are overworked and exhausted, and students are treating pre-existing rules as mere suggestions because they simply are not enforced. What makes you think the model policies will be different? Will you fire teachers that refuse to adhere to them? How will you replace those teachers? What if the replacements also refuse? The role of a public school is not to police a student's private decisions. The baseline of American politics is freedom. Freedom of religion, of speech, of self-defense, and of expression. These new policies threaten a breach in this core tenet of our society. The school system is being provided an outlet through which to overstep their just role. In 2020, Bostock versus Clayton County established that Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act guarantees protection from discrimination on the basis of gender and sexuality. The model policies do not adhere to this decision and therefore risk legal conflict with federal law. You are opening the district up to a slew of lawsuits by those who will be directly harmed by the policy implementation. This is America. I have a basic right to privacy in this country, just like everyone else. When I disclose information to an individual, I should be able to trust that it will not land directly in the laps of school officials that do not know me or my home life and who may further spread the information. Furthermore, what lengths will schools go to in order to document and police the identities of their students? What will I be asked by my teachers and counselors? Will there be new invasive questions on seasonal surveys? As an active citizen of Virginia Beach, of Virginia, and of America, I have certain rights, and I am curious how these policies will relate to and affect these rights. And that is time. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Geneva Warren, Alana Spencer, and then John Newell. Geneva Warren, Alana Spencer, John Newell, Lenny Matalaban. Hello and good evening. My name is Lane Malatambon and I'm an upcoming junior at Lansdowne High School. I'm here to speak of my concerns regarding the 2023 model policies regarding the treatment of trans and non-binary students. The policies state that a student's name and pronoun should correspond to that on their student official record, unless a parent permits their child to go by different pronouns or different name. Additionally, if a student who's transgender or gender nonconforming consults with student staff regarding their gender identity, that personal information can be disclosed to said student's family. This is not providing a safe environment for students. According to data collected from the Human Rights Campaign, roughly three in four LGBTQ plus youth don't feel they can fully be themselves at home. Schools should provide a place where students can be themselves, especially for groups like trans and non-binary students who can struggle much more due to discrimination and rejection. The misuse of a student's preferred pronouns and name will instead cause more mental health concerns as there's proven to be higher rates of suicide attempts for youth with no gender affirming spaces. Schools can keep providing that gender affirming space and improve mental health as long as they keep the current policies. I know for a fact that just using a student's preferred name can have such a positive impact because I see my friends get excited and ease up when they hear a teacher use it. I would also like to add that students, that schools should not, shouldn't have the responsibility of disclosing a student's gender identity to their parents. In accordance with Virginia laws, a minor is allowed to reject the disclosure of pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases to their parent or guardian. With these model policies, the exact outline of age sovereignty becomes blurry. If we allow a right to confidentiality regarding physical issues within a minor, why should that right be taken away when it comes to a request to be referred to differently? All students are worthy of privacy and acceptance as they are, regardless of their gender identity. And as a trans person, I understand the struggle of feeling that acceptance. I am always worried that my words and actions will make a difference or if I'm good enough, even now as I make the speech. Living in a world that denies my existence makes it so much more difficult to see our own worth. But by listening and considering the lives of these struggling groups, we can create a space where students can feel more comfortable in their own body. As an act of protection for their well-being, we need to ensure safety and privacy for all students, not just cisgender ones. Trans and non-binary children are real, and they always will be. They have voices, and they deserve to be heard. Please listen to our concerns, and please make the right decision. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jacob Young, Amati J. Prince, and then Jay Cook. 
Good evening. I'm Jacob Young, and I oppose the 2023 model policies. These policies are an intrusion of the privacy of our youth. Many transgender individuals may want to go by a name different from their birth name, which is something that they should not be scared to do. Many students consider school to be like a second home to them, and they're willing to be more open with the people there than they are with the people at their own household, because the people at their household may be abusive or neglectful. These policies will strip many of these children of the safety and will restrict, and it will restrict them on how they can act and what they say. These students' names are some of the most important things to them, and being able to go by their preferred name is a large step for many. They could be too afraid to speak out at home because of abuse or, so, or, or social expectations in their household, so many of them go to school for an escape. This place of protection will be taken away from these students and will leave them with nowhere to express themselves fully. The Pledge of Allegiance, something said at the beginning of every school day, gives us a fantastic quote that I believe we can all benefit from with liberty and justice for all. These policies would oppose these basic human rights and would not be giving these children the proper justice or liberty that they deserve. They would remove, they would remove the level of privacy that these children are entitled to and would make it more difficult for them at these places. These model policies, are also, these model policies also open the schools to potential lawsuits in the event it's found that they violate the, exec, the existing legislature. From the Virginia Human Rights Act to the HIPP, HIPAA to the danger transgender students may be placed in a result of these policies, the possibility of lawsuits ought to be enough to warrant hesitation, even if those lawsuits hold no water. Furthermore, these policies are a sharp juxtaposition from what our schools are used to. Whereas teachers were encouraged not to reveal a student's gender identity to a fellow staff member unless absolutely necessary, it appears that this understanding of confidentiality is completely disregarded in the new policies. How will teachers and counselors adjust to this shift in mindset? How much will it cost our schools to implement? These reasons are why I believe that these policies should not be enacted. They take away a place of comfort and protection from these children. They present possible legal challenges for our schools. It restricts them into a place which they may not want to be. It causes them to feel unwanted and forces them to change or even remove one of their most important 30 seconds or even remove one of their most important characteristics their identity thank you our next speaker is Amanti J Prince J Cook and Orion Davis good afternoon my name is Ami Tai I am 17 and I go to Kempsville High School I came out as transgender my sophomore year, smack dab in the middle in December. I had known that I was a guy years beforehand, but I was scared to let people in in that way because I knew the risk that it would start. Gender dysphoria is defined as the feeling of un unease and distress that occurs when trans people's gender identity doesn't match with how people refer and see to them. My gender dysphoria feels like being trapped in a hot Virginia car. Windows rolled up, doors closed. That suffocating feeling of wrongness, like my clothes are sticking too tight to me. It used to follow me everywhere. And that's why I came out. I know that when you're reading these policies, you know, we're talking about preferred pronouns and names that can see, seem so silly. You know, that we're, we're having all these meetings about something so so small, but it's not, it's not. When I went to school and came out and people were finally using he and pronouns for me for the first time, it felt like those windows in that Virginia car were getting rolled down just a little. Like I could finally breathe for the first time in a really long time. Section D6 of the model policy say that Teachers are no longer required or even encouraged to use students' preferred gender, um, gender characteristics or pronouns or names because of their, quote, constitutionally protected rights. I don't know what that means. What rights are we referring to? I have read that entire, entire model policy trying to find what is being described, and I can't. But you know what I do know? I know that if these policies get passed, I know that when I walk into my school building, 
that the administration feels that someone's vague constitutionally given rights are more important than my likelihood to kill myself. Because that's what we're talking about. It's not just what name you call me or what pronouns you use. We're talking about people's lives. 30 seconds. There was a study of 28,000 LGBTQ plus individuals from the ages of 13 to 24 from the Trevor Project, and it found that two in five, two in five queer individuals seriously tried or considered to kill themselves this past year. That is 41% of our population. When I was 15, I was staying up at least once every two weeks, begging and my that is time. not to kill themselves. Please vote no on this. Our next speaker is Jay Cook, then Orion Davis. Good evening, board members. My name is Jay Cook, and I'm a senior at Ocean Lakes High School. I would like to use my time tonight to pose one question to you all. Where does the line fall? The model policies are so overwhelmingly vague as they're presented, and they provide no guidelines on how to implement or enforce the desired changes. So where does the line fall? How much extra work are we going to give teachers and counselors in regards to this policy? What happens if there's malicious compliance? Furthermore, what is grounds for a faculty member to be suspicious of a child's gender identity? How would the mandatory reporting be enforced? And would both parents have to be called even in cases of divorce? If one parent approves of a child and the other doesn't, then who makes the final call? What would that disagreement do to a home environment, to a marriage, to a kid? Where does the line fall? Also, are we going to treat 14 through 17 year olds the same as elementary students? Will high school kids who in their workplaces are allowed to use the name and pronouns without being reported or forced, will they be forced to pretend to be someone else in schools to ensure their safety at home? Where does that line fall? If a guidance counselor reports that a child is experiencing gender dysphoria, which is listed in the DSM-5, will they be infringing on the right to medical and mental health privacy of a child who is 14 years or, or older? If those in opposition who believe that being transgender is an illness call for the reporting of transgender students like this, are they demanding a potential HIPAA violation? Where does the line fall? How will we enforce the use of a student's name with their friends? Will parents be informed if a classmate accuses a student of being transgender, or will the student themselves have to verify? In that case, can't the student just lie? How will we enforce the use of specific bathrooms? If a transgender student who passes masculinely uses the men's restroom and gets away with it, is the blame then placed on security or the teacher that allowed them to use the bathroom? What if they use the bathroom in between classes or at lunch, in which they need no e-hall pass? Where does that line fall? We cannot implement these policies and ask questions later. We cannot implement these policies as they are. We cannot let the transphobic ideology that backs these policies seep into our schools. And we most certainly cannot put the weight of these vague policies on our faculty, staff, and students. So where does the line fall? Perhaps that's something that should be set before anything, if at all, is put into place. 30 Thank seconds. You. Our next speaker is Orion Davis. Good evening, board members. I am Orion Davis, my pronouns are he, him, and I am a senior at Salem High School. In six days, the 2023-2024 school year will begin. Many high school students like myself will wake up in the disgustingly early hours of the morning, throwing on our long anticipated first day of school outfits and preparing to embark on our journey to our respective schools. As we all get to school, we reunite with our peers, catching up on our summer vacations and other activities while we were away. At this point, we notice one or even more of our friends are acting differently, not like themselves, like they're another person. As we settle into class and attendance is called, we find that our friend's name isn't called. Instead, we watch as their spirit breaks when they respond to their dead name, a name that was nothing but a mask covering the person we came to know and love. As the year persists, we can see our friend become less and less like the vibrant person that we once knew and more of a husk of their former, truer self. With this image in mind, I question how I or my peers are able to feel respected in an environment that is tailored specifically to harm us when all we want is to have access to our education and be comfortable. This is the reality of the 2023-2024 school year for transgender students. 
Enacting the 2023 trans model policies will not only take away what is supposed to be a safe place for all individuals, regardless of gender identity, sex, religion, race, or economic status, but it will also take away the life, liberty, and happiness from a member in our community. It will take away everything this country stands for and swore to protect. The 2023 model policy also contradicts our 14th Amendment's rights and ruling by the Supreme Court. The 14th Amendment guarantees the right to privacy, and violations include public disclosure of private facts. The Supreme Court ruled in 1969 that students do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gates. The 2023 model policies will also instill fear into the students of Virginia Beach schools. Fear that when they get home, they won't be greeted with smiling faces, but instead with malice and insults. Need I remind you, a speaker stood at the very podium and said they would disown their own flesh and blood because of their sexuality. Students should be thinking about their assignments and friends and jobs and responsibilities, not the possibility of going home to parents that will kick them out or in any other way abuse them or degrade them for being trans. The policies will harbor fear in the students, mistrust in the school board, and an even wider gap between parents and students. Do not let this become a reality. Do not let 30 seconds. Do not let fear fester in the hearts of the students. Do not let do not let these conditions win. Please to the school board heavily amend or reject the 2023 model policies. Do not let fear become our reality. Thank you. Our next speakers uh, will be Vincent Smith, Tom Conant, and then Matthew Cody Connor. Good evening, everybody. I'm Vincent Smith here from District 5. We've had a lot of concern here from the previous speakers about, you know, you might get sued. Well, I'm pretty sure you all know from recent events, you can all be sued by anybody at any time for anything. I think if you're really concerned about that tonight, you should also be concerned and, and balance that with concern from intervention from the AG's office if you do not adopt this, these model policies. Because as you all know, but I'm going to read it anyway for everybody else's information, Code of Virginia Section 22.1, 23.3B, each school board shall adopt policies that are consistent with but may be more comprehensive than the model policies developed by the DOE pursuant to subsection A. More comprehensive, not more lenient. So given that there's a law that says you have to do this, if you vote not to do this tonight, if you support not adopting these policies, I'm going to ask you to reflect for a moment on what message that sends to your teachers, to your administrators, and to your staff. You're basically telling them you don't have to follow the rules if you don't want to. So if you don't adopt the model policy, or if you do, Either way, you're kind of putting them in a bad position. You're putting them in a much worse position if you don't adopt these policies, because if you don't adopt them, then they don't have to follow the old ones anyway, because you said, well, you don't have to follow the rules. So I support this resolution, and I think you do need to adopt the model policies tonight. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tom Conant, Matthew Cody Connor, and then Joseph Com. I'm here tonight to insist that this board comply with Virginia law and with its own policy 5-7, which requires a superintendent to follow state law. I insist that you act with integrity and abide by Ms. Riggs' statement of 12 June when she said, when something comes out from the state or federal government, we always followed it. We abided by that. We have never veered off of that. So if and when our governor decides to put it out, we will be doing that. Several members of this board have said they would not support the model policies that are directed by the state. You recall telling concerned parents that you could not open schools, remove masking, or go against the former model policies that allowed boys to use girls' restrooms and instructed staff to support a minor's transition while keeping it from parents because it was out of our hands. You had to comply with state mandates. Well, the same conditions apply now. Will you hold to the same values? Or are you just political hypocrites? Our children are at a crossroads that we must, and we must lead them. The trans radical movement teaches kids that gender is a social construct and biological sex is not who they, one really is. They can be whatever they feel like they are. And anyone who says, wait, what or why is deemed a hater, transphobe and evil. We're forced to agree with and affirm whatever notion a child deems is their identity. One person calls this the tyranny of the minority. 
Listen, when a child says, I feel like this or that, and all they hear is, yes, your feelings tell the whole story, you are what you feel, where will they be able to weigh what they feel against the facts? Someone has to stand up and say, no, you are not non-binary, you are not trans. Why do you think that way? Someone needs to challenge the notion that gender is a social construct and show that the trans radical movement is itself a social construct that has been foisted on young minds through Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and other social media. It's the in thing to say I'm trans, gay, non-binary, or to affirm my friends who are. It gets likes. Who will tell them that hormone treatments, surgical procedures, and all they think they can do to change themselves will be permanently harmful and not solve their issue? Why not instead tell them that while they may be confused now, over 80% of that will be resolved by the time they finish puberty, and they will come to realize that God made them perfect from the beginning in the sex they were born with. 30 seconds. At the end of the day, reality is reality and truth is truth. To collaborate with someone's deep heartfelt confusion is to hurt them more than help them, and requiring our staff to participate in that confusion only does further harm. Do the right thing tonight and adopt policies that will put our schools back on track to support parents in guiding their own children to the truth that they are wonderfully made by God and he doesn't make any mistakes about their sexual makeup. And please stop the nonsense that puts the children in control of the public speaking time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matthew Cody Connor, Joseph Calm, and then Brenda Pence. I guess I should go ahead and start tonight with happy anniversary, because we've been doing this for a year. And in that year, you've heard every statistic, every personal story, every different viewpoint over and over again. So tonight, I'm just going to try and speak more plainly. Governor Youngkin's 2023 model school policies are dangerous to our trans and LGBTQ students. And they violate their human rights. The vast majority of the people that have shown up to speak in support of implementing them, have not had children in your schools for a very, very long time. And they want you to think that's because the actual parents of children in your schools are working too hard, they're too busy, too tired, even too scared. I'm an actual parent of kids in your schools. I have a very demanding job. I've been threatened at a school board meeting. I'm exhausted. This is my 12th speech here in a year. But I don't believe in being too busy or too tired, too scared, or too anything to show up for my kids. So you can miss me with all of that. And you can keep your religion and your church where it belongs and out of my kids' classrooms. We already had a time where science and logic played second fiddle and religion ruled everything, and we refer to that part of history as the dark ages. I'd rather not repeat them. Now, I agree that most parents love their kids. But these policies do not empower good, involved parents that love and support their children. Because those parents don't need a teacher or a principal or a counselor to tell them who their kid is. A child that is safe and seen shows themselves. The 2023 model school policies will only put those children that don't have those good parents in harm and abuse. They'll take away schools as a safe space for our kids that need them the most and force those children to hide and isolate themselves into nothingness. And the erasing of those children from where I stand seems to be exactly the goal. And that's evil. And those of you that support them, I mean, for Mrs. Manning to ask in open session, no less, whether or not you could use sovereign immunity to knowingly violate the Virginia Human Rights Act, that's disgraceful. And I'll be doing everything in my power to see you voted out. Our next speaker is Joseph Kahn, Brenda Pence. Speaker six had to cancel, and then it's gonna be Homer Stinson. Good evening, my name is Joe Combe. I'm a lifelong Virginia Beach resident, a proud graduate of Salem High School and an attorney. I spoke to you a few weeks ago and I'm here to follow up on my comments by discussing three reasons why you ought to adopt the 2023 model policies um, that you're considering and support and protect the children of Virginia. By the way, it's great to see my former principal from Salem High School, Dr. Robertson here tonight. Um, 
The first reason you should adopt the policies is, is that they protect parental rights by requiring schools to allow parents to make decisions about their child's education and well-being, and they ensure parents are included in their child's school counseling. Parental involvement is one of the most important predictors of a child's emotional well-being, academic achievement, and overall development. Our children deserve a school system that enables parental involvement and thereby provides the best support for children. And Virginia law even requires this, as you've already heard. Parents especially have a responsibility and a constitutional right to know when their child is experiencing a mental health crisis, including an identity crisis about their sexuality. Parents need to be notified of changes to their child's mental health so they can get their children the help and care they need. By involving parents in their children's academic lives, the 2023 model policies enable our schools to create environments that promote child and family flourishing. The second reason is that the 2023 model policies vindicate the privacy rights of young girls in school bathrooms and locker rooms and promote fairness in girls' sports. Girls have a legitimate interest in privacy and safety. When differences in biological sex are implicated, that's something that Loudoun County has tragically taught us all. Title IX, Virginia's Constitution, and the 2023 model policies support girls by acknowledging that the biological and physical differences between males and females create a need for privacy and protection. Specifically, the 2023 model policies defend the privacy and safety of girls by designating sex-segregated locations and activities according to immutable biological sex, not subjective gender identity. The third reason I'm going to give you to vote in favor of the model policies is, is much simpler, self-interest. A new Monmouth poll released today shows that 81% of New Jerseyans support parental notification when their child is struggling with their identity. New Jersey is no bastion of conservatism or religious fervor, yet they are overwhelmingly united on this issue. What was the last time a so-called social issue so universally united a single voting bloc? If New Jerseyans feel this way, imagine how the many parents in this district feel. There's a term for voting against this issue. 81% of your constituents are for, and that's political suicide. So I'm going to conclude by praying briefly for all of you. Lord Jesus, I lift these members of the Virginia Beach School Board up to you, asking you to bless them richly with your wisdom and courage. Fill each one of them with your Holy Spirit's presence, which brings insight, strength, and peace. Let your conviction and love drive them to empower the families you created so that every child will thrive. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your time. Please vote for the policies. Our next speaker is Brenda Pence, Homer Stinson, and then Noah Moreland. Good evening. I am Brenda Pence, a retired Virginia Beach school teacher and concerned citizen. There is a welcome sense of relief knowing the 2023 model policies will finally be voted on tonight. And yet at the same time, there is a deep concern that sound reasoning and judgment will be swept away by a failed political ideology. You know the one I'm talking about, the past model policy stripping parental rights, which in turn led to young girls being raped in girls' bathrooms and girls having their breasts removed at age 15. But the fact remains, parents have the right to know but if Virginia Beach school staff, including teachers and counselors, can tell a minor not to tell their parents and keep the secret if it relates to sexual identity issues, it is dangerous and unacceptable. Is keeping the secret advice not the behavior of bad people like pedophiles and drug dealers? So who can justify clinging to the old and dangerous 2021 model policies? Therefore, I urge Acting Superintendent Dr. Robertson to direct the Virginia Beach School Board to adopt the 2023 model policies as written. Why? For the obvious reasons I have stated and because he is compelled by Governor Youngkin's recent clarification of the policy. And I quote Governor Youngkin, parents are in charge of their children's lives. The school districts will, in fact, abide by the law. It is the law. You don't have a choice, unquote. I've said it before, and I will say it again. Rest assured, the new 2023 model policies are not based on some dangerous political ideology. They are founded in reality and in truth. The policy is clean, it's equitable, and returns parental rights and oversight to the parents. 
while accommodating all student needs. Therefore, there is no other moral or legal option than for the school board to vote unanimously to support the 2023 model policies for all schools in Virginia Beach. Thank you. Our next speaker is Homer Stinson, Noah Moreland, and then Diana Howard. Good evening. I strongly urge the adoption of the 2023 model policies without further delay. Not everyone has read those policies, so here's a few snippets word for word. Section 3, paragraph D1, it reads, quote, every effort should be made to ensure that a transgender student wishing to change his or her means of address is treated with respect, compassion, and dignity in the classroom and school environment. Does that sound like bigotry? Is it anti-trans? Is it discrimination? Section 3, paragraph D4, states that personnel, quote, shall refer to a student by name other than the one in the student's official record, or by pronouns other than those appropriate to the sex appearing in the student's official record, only if an eligible student or a student's parent has instructed in writing that such other name and other pronouns be used. In other words, the 2023 model policies permit transgender students to use a different name and or pronouns in school, provided they are 18 or older, emancipated, or have written permission from their parents. So why would anyone oppose these policies? Do we truly care about transgender students, or are we really more focused on denying the basic human right of parents to determine what is best for their child's mental health. No exceptions. And who could possibly oppose those model policies? Would it be a childless teenager providing parenting advice? Would it be somebody seeking big money for puberty blockers, hormones, and counseling that ultimately leads to surgery? Or is it some random groomer on social media? And do any of those qualifications outweigh the basic human right of parents to decide what is best for their children. Now, some will claim falsely that this is an LGBT issue. Is it? Check out gaysagainstgroomers.com and you will learn that the issue is really about activists pushing an extreme agenda instead of working to promote academic excellence. Now, you may be encouraged to bury the 2023 model policies in the Policy Review Committee. Please don't. Instead, bring this to a vote and quickly approve it so that you can ease the minds of students and concerned parents alike. 30 Thank seconds. You. Our next speaker is Noah Moreland, Diana Howard, and then Icarus Landacker. Truth, of, as we have seen in the case of fact and reality, is totally unyielding in the face of belief, desire, tradition, and will. There is no such thing as a belief or statement whose quality of truth or falsity is modified by mere belief or disbelief, desire or aversion, habit or tradition, or social practice or professional opinion, or even will and intent. Belief is relative, as are perceptions, but truth is not. Truth is a relation, a correspondence, but not one that depends upon belief or attitude. It is a relation, but it is not relative. It pertains to the mind in a certain sense as a property of beliefs and statements, but it is not subjective in the sense that it varies with our attitudes about it or would not exist unless those attitudes did. To refute a few mistruths that were stated in the last meeting by some speakers, not wanting a student advisor to the board is not an anti-student position because any adult who has not wallowed in the glee of childishness for longer than is typical can tell you that kids do not know what is best for them. Contrary to one, what one speaker said, it is also not unusual for someone to state that they feel like they do not have a representative on the board. It is well known that with every election, there is a large contingent of voters who do not get what they want. I would argue the level of critical thinking a citizen must have to not see this is even further points to a further a failure of our education system to teach those among us basic civics. Opponents to these policies point to his vagueness, but interestingly, you heard no complaints about vagueness in the so-called anti-harassment resolution that was passed in June, a resolution that I might remind you is both vague and not legally binding. Didn't have a problem passing resolutions and asking questions later back then. And finally, a lot of speakers suggested that it was hypocritical of us to have asked for so long for teachers to not co-parent their kids and then support new model policies that do just that. 
This is what's known as a straw man and misleads those listening into thinking the Youngkin policies do something that they actively forbid. And even if they ask teachers to co-parent, you've heard straight from the horse's mouth that most teachers actively promote and encourage LGBT ideology. That is co-parenting. And if your only response is to call us bigoted, then you truly have no leg to stand on. The Dark Ages were called such because there was almost a complete absence of religion and most scientific advancements in history were actually funded by the church. Contrary to popular belief, science and religion are intricately intertwined, not polar opposites. If you look for truth, you may find comfort in 30 seconds. If you look for comfort, you will not get either comfort or truth, only soft soap and wishful thinking to begin and in the end, despair. Truth is, life is hard for everyone. We are not owed comfort, we each have our own cross to bear, and the new model policies put our education system back in its rightful place to educate nothing more, nothing less. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Howard, then Icarus Landacker, then Natalie Gonzalez. Good evening, I'm Diana Howard. I'm the chair of the Virginia Beach Tea Party and we support Ms. Manning's resolution to implement the governor's model policy that respects parental rights and the dignity of all children. And I say respect parental rights because parents never gave up their rights. They may have been trampled on, but they never gave them up and they need to exercise them. Now, you're in the business of education, not mental health. So if there are parents out there that cannot accept their kids being trans, then maybe they need some counseling as well or they need to be you know, reported if there is any abuse. Now, I'm sure every teacher has a roster of kids for their classroom and if any of their kids want to change their pronouns and a boy called Sue wants to do that, then they need to get permission from their parents, and I don't understand why that's a problem, okay? So most of these kids, I think, are going to like grow out of this growing transgender, picking whatever your sex is or whatever, but the kid you need to be worried about is the one that actually has a problem with reconciling with the gender that they were born, the ones that have gender dysphoria, which is a medical condition, a mental health condition, and it's still listed that way. That child does need help because they do have stress and anxiety, and they're prone to um, you know, suicide, and they may do something, and you don't want to be that person that does not let their parents know that this is going on. They should not be kept in the dark about it. You don't want to be sued because you never said anything. So that's the child that we need to be concerned about. And so I hope you're going to pass the, the resolution and implement the policy. Thank you. Our next speaker is Icarus Landacker, Natalie Gonzalez, then Becky Hay. Good evening. My name is Icarus Landaker, a recent graduate of the IB program at Princeton High School. I am also non-binary, and I have not and will not grow out of that. I am not a lawyer, and I by no means claim to be one. However, there are questions and concerns I feel should be brought forth before the board regarding the legality of the Model 2023 policies. It is no secret that this board passed a non-discrimination resolution two months ago specifically protecting the rights of transgender students. In this resolution, it states that the board will not violate state, local, and federal law. In the following paragraph, it references the Bostock v. Clayton County where the Supreme Court ruled that the legislation, that legislation shall not discriminate on the basis of perceived or actual gender identity, a fact we have all been repeatedly presenting to this board over the months. Additionally, the DSM-5 lists gender dysphoria as an official mental illness. This means that under the policies, if a counselor is required to reveal to a parent what a student disclosed to them, and that material directly relates to the, to the diagnostic criteria of gender dysphoria, it could potentially be a HIPAA violation. Finally, I would like to address the Virginia Human Rights Act by, sharing, by starting with the basics, definitions. 
The Virginia Human Rights Act defines gender identity as gender-related appearance, identity, or other related characteristics of an individual without regards to the individual's designated sex at birth, which directly conflicts with the definition in the Model 2023 policies, which relates this definition to differing from designated sex at birth. Furthermore, nowhere in the Virginia Human Rights Act does it mention parental written approval in order to be considered trans, unlike the Model 2023 policies. Later in Section 2.2-3904, non-discrimination in places of public accommodation, it states it is unlawful for employees of a public accommodations to indirectly or directly deny or attempt to deny an individual from any facilities, services, privileges of public places. That includes counseling and restrooms of the school. It also specifically states that this discrimination shall not occur to individuals who are less than 18 years of age. The Virginia Human Rights Act is a state law that through federal law and Owens resolution, this board is obligated to adhere by. If the model 2023 policies are implemented, 30 seconds. it opens doors for many potential lawsuits that the board would not risk if the policies were heavily amended or simply not adopted. These policies are targeting a very specific group, hiding it behind the words dignity and respect, despite never having consulted this population. We speak of freedom of speech and democracy whose core principles is we the people. Representatives and anyone else in the position of power are removed when they do not listen to or represent the people. The same should be done to policies. These Model 2023 policies- And that is time. Our next speaker is Natalie Gonzalez, Becky Hay, then Donna Fulan. I've been attending these meetings and speaking out against Governor Yunkin's model policies for about eight months now, and I find that many of the criticisms we had of the drafted 2022 policies still apply to the 2023 policies. It is disheartening to see such a lack of receptiveness from the Department of Education, and it's worth noting that the policies still contradict evidence-based best practices regarding the treatment of transgender students. The most frightening thing to, about these policies to me, however, is how intrusive they are. As Ms. Martin said, in order for parents to become completely informed, the schools must become completely, completely informed. The policies don't specify what would warrant a teacher or counselor reporting a student to their parents or what staff would be required to do in the event they discover a student is trans. Would going by a different name among friends be enough to constitute a trip to the guidance office or would a student have to directly divulge their identity to a teacher? If it's the latter, would any trans student come out to a teacher if they knew they would get outed? The policies wouldn't keep parents informed but would instead incentivize students to hide their identities. I've been attending these meetings for about eight months now, and I've only been out of high school for about three months. I remember being 14, 15, and 16. I remember getting my first job and my driver's license, and I remember getting my own debit card and weekly paychecks. Growing up in an unstable home, my autonomy meant everything to me. It was what allowed me to find my own independence, and I'm sure that many students can relate to that. I could not imagine not being allowed to go by a different name at school, but being allowed to do so at work. I couldn't imagine being allowed to become employed without my per parents' permission, but not being allowed to be called a different set of pronouns at school. These policies treat all transgender students the same, regardless of if they're seven or 17. The previous 2021 policies respected the way age affects how schools should proceed when cooperating with a student and their parents. In the case of young elementary school students showing signs of gender dysphoria, it would be reasonable to discuss it with the student's parents, but it makes very little sense to use the same procedure you would for a kindergartner on a teenage student, especially if that procedure ignores the individual student's needs and potentially causes their family to disown or reject them. These policies would not only be ineffective, but would make learning so much more difficult for transgender students, in addition to being a struggle to implement and opening the school system up to potential lawsuits. Several school boards in Virginia have already decided to accept the policies, and several school boards have already decided to reject them. This board knows what is best for Virginia Beach, and I hope that it will develop policies and procedures seconds. that are best for our students, not simply what the Department of Education has passed down to us. Thank you. Our next speaker is Becky Hay, Donna Foulihan, and then Natasha Lamel. Good evening. First, I'd like to welcome and wish Dr. Robertson success in your new role here. Secondly, to the board, the time is now to a vote to approve and implement the model policies as set forth by Governor Yunkin and the VDOE. 
The recent resolution put forward by Ms. Owens and approved by some of you recently was nothing more than a word salad of feel-good platitudes that have no binding power and do not over override existing state law. The 2022 model policies rightly acknowledge the role of parents and of school districts regarding students in our state. The authority of the school board or its agents never overrides the authority of the parents in the eyes of the state or of God. For those of you, such as Mrs. Franklin and Mrs. Melnick and others who are concerned about litigation, the policies put forth by Governor Yunkin and the VDOE are consistent with state law. Although you may receive intimidating emails attempting to coerce you to defy the policies, when you align with the law and with parents who have moral and legal oversight of their children, you have nothing to fear. If you were truly concerned about litigation, perhaps you would have used more oversight regarding the disastrous ODS selection process this year, resulting in litigation against the board that is currently moving forward in court. Mrs. Melnick previously mentioned that Ms. Linetti presented her legal analysis to the board in closed session. However, no doubt dozens of legal experts provided input and advice during the crafting of the model policies before and after the thousands of public comments were made last fall. Respectfully, I would tend to give more weight to the many legal minds working together at the VDOE over our district's council. As Governor Yunkin re recently stated, we are very straightforwardly saying that first, parents are in charge of their children's lives. The kids do not belong to the state. They belong to parents and to families, and they have the ultimate say in decisions that the child is going to make with a parent, not a bureaucrat. The school districts of Spotsylvania and Roanoke quickly did what is appropriate and have already approved the implementation of model policies in their districts. It would be wise for our district to follow their lead, vote tonight to approve the resolution and implement the model policies. There have been a lot of speakers tonight trying to convolute the issue, make complex statements, um, speaking from emotions. These, most of them are children. And it's really simple. You involve the parents. You keep them involved. You let them know what's going on. You're transparent. It is not your job to determine if a parent needs to know something. It is your job to educate the children. Thank you. Our next speaker is Donna Flulahan, Natasha Lamel, and then Julia Coleman. Good evening. Tonight I would like to talk about truth, something that's been mentioned several times tonight. Last fall, in a Senate hearing, Mar Marsha Blackburn, a United States Senator, asked a nominated Supreme Court justice to define the word woman. The nominee's famous response was, I am not a biology major, and would not define it. Sadly, the nominee was still appointed to the Supreme Court. I find it amazing that a Supreme Court justice could not define the word woman with at least an, a chromosome fact. I surmise that her truth went against the truth. So she declined to answer the question. In another Senate hearing, United States Senator Ted Cruz asked Riley Gaines, a female championship swimmer, is there a difference between men and women? Riley Gaines had tied a championship race with a six foot four biological male, but she did not go home with the trophy. So much for Title IX rights so feverishly fought for in the years past. Before the race, she had to share a locker room with this same male in preparation for the race. She very definitely could answer the question that there was a difference between and why. In the same hearing, Senator Ted Cruz asked another panelist, Kelly Robinson, president of the, United, uh, president of the Human Rights Campaign, is there a difference between men and women? Senator Cruz had to ask the question no less than five times. As with the Supreme Court nominee, Ms. Robinson could not answer the question, again, because it would be liar ideology that is not based on truth. Truth always dispels falsehoods. It seems truth is, is very elusive these days. It seems everyone wants to proclaim they have the truth. Usually it's based on what's right for them, but real truth is based on something outside of self and applies to all people equally. Truth visited this earth a couple of thousand years ago. Yes, Jesus taught and lived about absolute truth. He even proclaimed he is the truth. But men who define truth by their own beliefs condemned truth to a death on the cross. They derailed it for a few days, but truth was resurrected three days later. And then came men's salvation, the greatest love story ever told. My point, my point is Governor Yonkin's model policies are based on truth 
30 seconds. Which should be the cornerstone for all our education policies and subjects in the Virginia Beach schools. That is what is right for all our students. It is my desire the school board and its policy committee not circumvent the governor's policies, but make sure that they are implemented immediately. Thank you. Our next speaker is Natasha Lamel, Julia Coleman, and then Vastino Kolova. Good evening, members of the board and citizens. I stand before you as an advocate for teachers. I am excited to begin a new year with new minds and new opportunities to ignite critical thinkers. The message we received today from Dr. Robertson is encouraging as he referred to a goal of ensuring that staff and students feel supported, valued, seen, heard, and respected. It is from this perspective that I address you this evening. As you all navigate through meetings and make decisions for the betterment of our district, I implore every board member present and active to seriously consider the needs of teachers. Educators are the only ones who truly connect with the demands of student needs from instructing, planning engaging lessons, building relationships with families, and collaborating with colleagues. My hope for this council is to recognize these demands and respect the time that it takes to not only do well in our profession, but to continue to love it. Loving it means we know that every day will not be perfect, but we decide to stay and come back every day. <laughs> Many of you married council members should be able to relate to that. We are being robbed of the time we need to stay connected and be effective. Teachers officially began school this week, but many came in last week to set up their classrooms due to lack of time and insurmountable tasks placed on us daily. We work countless hours without compensation or complaint, but it's time to stop normalizing this. You are losing great teachers, and we are treated as if there is no teacher shortage. We have many meetings during pre-service week, which I'm sure you're aware of. This includes completing mandatory training, collaborating with leadership, and meeting and training new teammates. As grade level chair, I can readily share with you that teachers are displeased at the time you've taken from our schedule. Our school year starts earlier this year and ends later than other districts. Our holiday schedule is shorter than neighboring cities as we do not receive a full two weeks. You are not receiving decreased effort from those of us who want to be here, but you are distributing seconds. consideration. If the theme or vision for this school year is the science of hope, your continued inaction aids educators in losing hope. Thank you for your time and consideration for my comments. On another note, all of you are invited to my school for a gentleman's welcome at SeaTac Elementary School and Achievable Dream Academy. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Julia Coleman, Faustino Kuluga, and then April Sherman. Julia Coleman, Faustino Kuluga, Good evening. I'm Faustino, a freshman at Regent University. I am speaking in strong support of the 2023 model policies on ensuring privacy, dignity, and respect for all students and parents in Virginia's public schools. These common sense policies will protect children's rights, parents' rights, and women's rights in the state of Virginia. For reference, I will be quoting from the 2023 model policy, which I believe is very straightforward. The 2023 model policy states, quote, no student shall be required to participate in any counseling program to which the student's parents object. And, quote, parents must be informed and given an opportunity to object before counseling services pertaining to gender are given. The Constitution, the Supreme Court of the United States, and the laws of the state of Virginia all unanimously recognize the fundamental rights that parents have to direct the upbringing of their children. So let's keep radical ideologies out of our schools. Let's keep politics out of our schools. And let's get back to reading, writing, and math. 
The 2023 model policy states, quote, school division personnel shall refer to each student using only the pronouns that are listed in their official record. That is, male pronouns for a student who is male and female pronouns for a student who is female. A boy cannot become a girl. Neither can a girl become a boy. When you deny these basic biological facts, devastating problems result. For example, according to Reuters statistics, between, seven, between 2017 and 2021, over 17,000 children began using either puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones. This is child abuse and needs to stop right now. The 2023 model policy also states, students shall use bathrooms that correspond to his or her gender. Men should not be allowed in women's restrooms because women's rights matter. We, the people, must organize, stand up, and speak out against the politicization of our public schools. We must stay informed and hold every school board member accountable at the ballot box. And to the school board, if you believe in parents' rights, and if you believe in children's rights, and if you believe seconds. in parents' rights, please join with me and the people of Virginia Beach and implement the 2023 model policies on ensuring privacy, dignity, and respect for all students and parents. Thank you. Our next speaker is April Sherman, William Devins, and then Amy Mack. April Sherman, William Devins, Good evening, my name is Bill Evans. Tonight, I wish to address the implementation of the recently released model policies on ensuring privacy, dignity, and respect for all students and parents in Virginia's public schools. I quote from the revised model policy, each school board shall, I repeat, shall adopt policies that are consistent with the model policies. Without question, there is no wiggle room Implementation is mandatory. As a means of implementing this revised policy, I urge the board to adopt Ms. Manning's resolution that this board directs the superintendent or designee to replace the entire current Regulation 571 with the 2023 Model Policies for Virginia Beach City Public Schools document that is attached to Mrs. Manning's resolution and without modification. As for future reference, I want to remind you that these kids are only on loan to you for a period of time each school day. They are not yours. They belong to and are answerable to their parents or guardians. No school employee should ever be hiding significant information regarding a student from their parent or guardian. Accordingly, penalties need to be established for those school employees who withheld critical information about a child from their parent or guardian. Again, I repeat, these kids are not yours. Again, please pass Ms. Manning's resolution without modification. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Amy Mack and Richard Pickens, then Daryl Clark. Hello, my name is Amy Mack and I am a parent and voter in Virginia Beach. And I'm here to ask the school board to vote in favor of Governor Youngkin's 2023 model policies. However, if you choose not to support these policies, I want to ask what is the plan for care and support for children expressing gender confusion and gender dysphoria? It's my understanding that gender dysphoria is more than being called a different name or different pronoun or wearing different clothes when they go to school. Gender dysphoria encompasses emotional, psychological, and medical support. These children need guidance and care and if you're keeping parents in the dark, who is going to stand in the place as the parent? Is it you, the school board? Is it the school administration? Or the teachers? Or do you care? Is it not your problem? Nobody knows my children like I do. Nobody loves my children as much as I love them. And I will stand by my children regardless of circumstances. 
And I believe this is true of the majority of parents in Virginia Beach. But if you vote against the 2023 model policies, then you've taken that out of my hands and all parents' hands. So I ask you again, if you're going to support children to deceive and be dishonest to their parents, are you going to stand in the gap and emotionally and financially support these children and their needs? Thank you. Our next speaker is Richard Pickens, then Daryl Clark, then Beth Sinowick. Yes, my name is Richard Pickens. I support the model policies. And one of the things I hear students saying a lot is <clears throat> they don't want their rights to be taken away from them, but you have to realize that the rights of parents are superior to your rights at this point in your life. And the parents have that right because they bear the responsibility of liability for anything that you would do when something goes wrong. They're the one that gets called. They're the one that's held responsible. And that's the way it should be. And so there's a a great concern that those rights be taken away and children and youth can be led but you can also be misled and I'm going to pick on pride month it promises that you can be your authentic self but requires a lifetime of medication to pull it off and this type of indoctrination misleads our most vulnerable children and youth into areas of moral mental and physical harm and I was at a local library recently, pulled several books from a rainbow carousel just a few feet away from tiny chairs and low tables. I read through the pictures and the cartoon drawings of male and female anatomy, the distortion of language to instruct children that you're not a boy, you're not a girl at birth. This instills a lie that can have horrific impact on the future physical, mental, emotional, and moral welfare of children. Therefore, I stand opposed to the educational system being the uh, transfer of that kind of information, and I believe that we should not support it or encourage or applaud it. We should applaud the individual achievements of every person and treat everybody with kindness, but we should not support a moral uh, issue that's seen as repulsive and harmful by many. A medically introduced womb in a biological man will always be a wound, a wound that the body will constantly try to heal and close. It can only be kept open with the use of drugs that arrest the body's natural functions. Young women will find themselves being asked to undergo expensive surgeries that remove healthy and functioning female parts and replace them with stitches, scars, and a sadness that, according to many reports, increases over the years to come. I would like to uh, <clears throat> throw down the gauntlet to Mr. Matthew Coder Connor, and my challenge is this. It's really a nice one. I would love to go out and have coffee with you, have a conversation apart from this setting, because I believe that discussion and civil discourse is probably the greatest thing that we can do. And I offer that to anyone on the transgender side seconds. or the um, LBGTQ side. I'd love to have a discussion because I love to converse and, and share ideas. And I will leave my business card at the back of the auditorium or I'll be around and I'll be glad to set up that time with you. I say that we need to support um, these issues we need to support parents. Parents are not ugly, horrible human beings like they're always represented here, like they're the worst of the worst. I'm sure there are problems that parents have a right to know what's going on in the lives of their students. At this time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Daryl Clark, then Beth Sinowick. What's up? My name is Darrell Clark. Uh, before I get started, I want to say I've been coming here for some time now like the past like two or three or whatever. And I keep hearing people say that their kids are on loan to the school. And I'm so sick of hearing that. Stop saying it. These, they are not property. These are people. I don't care who you are. Stop saying that kids are on loan, like there's some car that you're letting someone borrow. It's awful. Now, there, there is no trans or queer agenda. It's not an ideology. This is not any kind of indoctrination going on. They're not out here making up all this data. They're not making up all these statistics and all these stories. Nothing that they're being, that's being said is hyperbolic at all. There is no radical movement. Trans and queer people have existed for millennia. Like people think that these kids are being hired to speak here. Like that's, that's, that's just dumb. Like it's so dumb. Like it doesn't, like it's, it's like, it's, award-winningly dumb to believe that 
all of that effort to, 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 to try to convince people of basic human rights. Like, that's, it's, it's mind-blowing. Like, seriously, take a second to think about how stupid that sounds. Like, and the fact is that all of these, like, lies and misinformation, all of this is being projected onto them by conservatives and people on the far right because that's what conservatives and those on the far right are actively doing. Like the same way that a, a manipulative person projects their own wrongdoings onto their spouse as if they're the ones doing it, like that's what they're doing. They're the ones making up all these lies, spreading this misinformation and saying that it's an evil ideology and they're projecting their actions onto queer and trans youth in order to sway more people into believing their ideology, which is to eradicate tr uh, trans and queer people from society, and that ideology is indeed a fascist one. We've been here before, it's happened. History has shown that. This is serious, this is deadly serious. I don't know if y'all been listening to what these kids have been saying for over a year now. This is deadly serious. So you either are gonna support and pr protect and empower these kids or you're gonna support and empower, and, empower and protect those who are trying to eradicate them from society. Reject the model policies. Reject them. Listen to what they've been saying for almost a year now and it's ain't even just about the ones that are here, it's about the ones who are watching remotely, it's about the ones elsewhere in the country, it's about the ones elsewhere in the state, it's about the ones elsewhere in the world and the ones who ain't here because they either have taken themselves off of here or are just scared to come here. And that is time. Our next speaker is Beth Sinowick. Hello, um, thank you for letting me talk today and thank you for being on the board and taking all this seriously. Um, I've had two daughters. Uh, they both graduated from Virginia Beach School Systems um, and I, I have a history of uh, bachelor's science in nursing um, and I'm quite appalled with what I'm seeing in the medical industry right now, um, especially with the youth. Um, just know that it's hard enough to be a kid and I do know what that's like because I was their age once and I was bullied and I have a history of sexual um, abuse that I went through and just a whole bunch of things that would make it very difficult for somebody that went through that to go into a bathroom and have a biological male enter even if they had good intentions. That would be a very uncomfortable situation for me. So I particularly like that um, I, in the uh, Yunkin policies that they specifically mention that and with sports also. Um, the human body is the most complex and unique organism in the world and that speaks volumes of its creator and every aspect of the body down to the tiny, tiniest microscopic cell. And I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made and your works are wonderful. And I know that well. That is uh, from Psalms 139. Um, and I just want to say that um, you're beautiful just the way you were created and you have a purpose. And I, I don't like to go away from that because, you know, everything that happened to me, it was like I thought that I was supposed to be on a boat since I was eight and something happened with me in the last couple years where I ended up praying for my family and I felt the love of God. And I know that people don't want to hear that, but especially if you're feeling confused or scared, you need to hear that because he is love. And this feeling was like unlike anything I've ever experienced in my life. And, and I do want to share that with people um, because it removed my pain and remove my fears, and remove my addictions. And I can't make that up, nor would I want to. But the bottom line is, dealing with a bunch of pharmacies that want to pump kids with meds that have side effects that they don't know what's going to happen with them. So I think it's important to let parents in on what's happening with their children, and that's why I support the model policies, and I ask that you do vote for them. Um, there's so much to say, I can't say it in three minutes, so I apologize if it's a chopped up speech because I just don't have enough time, but um, thank you for letting me speak. One more. It's eight o'clock. Two more, okay. Our 
next speaker will be Jeremiah Dawson and then A.D. Bond. Hello, thank you for letting me speak. I'm in favor of the resolution of, Doc, of um, Governor Youngkin's policies. I think a lot of people are getting caught up in the fact, someone else said it earlier, that it's not about politics. It's not about politics at all. I think it's about trust, and it's about honesty and integrity. What we have between parents and teachers and administration, that we should all be on the same thing and doing what's best for our children. No one loves our children more than the parents. I know everybody's into this program. Board members, teachers, administrators of all sorts, because you love children and you want what's best for them. I see that the middle schoolers go from elementary school and they're all of 11 and 12 years old and now they're like, oh, I can pick a different name. I can do this, I can do that. And then you have the possibility of, you don't have to tell your parent. What? <laughs> Not, really? You can keep it between you and me. These are secrets. Secrets are not good. Secrets cause shame. Secrets cause a lot of problems later on. Um, I don't understand how any of that could be good at that level. At the, you have the high schoolers. Um, they will test our boundaries. They will, they will always test boundaries. We tested boundaries, that's the way it is. But nowhere has teachers ever then said, we won't tell the parents. It's between you and me. You know, we'll keep your secret. Who sh should get to do that? We love our children. We want to help them. We want them to understand, but no parent should be interfered with between that social standard within the family. It's, we have teachers now that then are caught in a predicament. If the child is bullied or they're having problems in school with grades all around gender identity, they can't just talk to their parents. They can't bring it up to them because that's against the rules. 30 seconds. It does not help the teacher. It does not help the parent. It does not help the children. We're supposed to be helping the children. We love the children. And you have to keep us in. Otherwise, why even have a PTA? Just have a parent organization, and you have a teacher's organization, and you have an administration org, because no one's working together. And we should listen to one another and let us grow. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Bond. Y'all are giving me a great gift of time afterwards, so thank you very much. I'm here to ask you to vote for the position that I think will save the lives of kids. That is for the resolution, because involving parents saves children's lives. There are good parents and there are bad parents. Those who disagree with the resolution may be doing so out of a concern for kids living with bad parents, who, if they came out, would kick them out. That's bad parenting. That's neglect. That's child abuse. That's criminal. There are consequences to being a bad parent. There are also lots of organizations out there that help those kids that are kicked out. Stand Up for Kids is a great one. But the law says that's child abuse. So what really objecting to the resolution does is it disempowers good parents. And it's good parents that matter. And the reason is, and I sent you all the studies but uh, study says we find that easing access to cross-sex treatments without parental consent significantly increases suicide rates. We take advantage of a natural policy experiment. The references are, have been given to you by email by me earlier. That results from the fact that some states have legal provision that allows minors access to medical care without parental consent, and 
while other states have no such provision. There is a 14% increase in suicide rates among young people by 2020 in states that have a provision allowing minors access to care without parental consent relative to states that require it. Easier access to puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones by minors without their parents' involvement actually exacerbates student suicide rate. Let's save lives. I'm on the kids' saving lives bandwagon. That's, a ban that's including- 30 seconds. Parents. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for the, allowing me to speak after eight. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to um, go back and we'll return to um, speakers, the virtual speakers, after our information um, section. So we are now on information. A, program evaluation schedule for 23-24. 2023-24, welcome Dr. Heidi Janicki, Director of Research and Evaluation. Good evening, Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, members of the school board, and Dr. Robertson. I'm Dr. Heidi Janicki, Director of Research and Evaluation. This evening, I will share the proposed schedule of program evaluations that will be conducted during 2023-24. The schedule is developed based on school board policy 6-26. Before presenting the evaluation schedule for the upcoming year, I'll provide an overview of the evaluation reports that will be provided in upcoming months based on last year's schedule. The reports that will be provided to the school board this fall and winter based on the 2022-23 program evaluation schedule are shown on the slide. These include the year one implementation evaluation of Canvas, the division's learning management system, the year three evaluation of PBIS with a focus on the implementation of advanced tiers two and three of the PBIS framework. The year one implementation evaluation of the alternative education program at Renaissance Academy. And the comprehensive evaluation of the gifted resource cluster program that will address aspects of program operation as well as outcomes. As stipulated by school board policy, the proposed 2023-24 program evaluation schedule that will be shown on the next slide was developed based on evaluation requirements for programs. Based on the policy, new programs or initiatives that operate with local resources are evaluated for a minimum of two years and then during the year of full implementation if a program takes more than two years to implement. In addition, programs that have been previously evaluated may remain on the schedule as a result of an evaluation plan for the program that was previously approved by the school board. Each year, the proposed program evaluation schedule is presented to the superintendent senior staff and the planning and performance monitoring committee to obtain feedback regarding recommendations. The proposed evaluation schedule for the upcoming 2023-24 school year will require school board approval. The proposed program evaluation schedule for the upcoming 2023-24 school year is shown on the slide. The year two evaluation of Canvas in 2023-24 will focus on the outcomes of implementing Canvas and goal attainment. The second year evaluation of alternative education at Renaissance Academy will continue to focus on program operation as well as collecting data related to student outcomes. The final addition to the schedule is the proposed implementation evaluation of behavioral and mental health supports for students. This includes new initiatives or expansions of related initiatives that have not been evaluated previously. The evaluation in 2023-24 will address multiple initiatives including the implementation of the Behavior Intervention Support Team, Rapid Response Initiative, the Bridge Program, Responsive Classroom, the base program, and community in schools. This, con this concludes the presentation of the program evaluation schedule for the upcoming school year. I'm available for any questions at this time. There's no questions. Thank you, um, Dr. Janecki. Thank you.
the Policy Review Committee. Good evening. Welcome, Ed. Dr. Linetti. I mean, Miss. <laughs> Doctor, Cammy I do Linetti. have a doctorate degree, but we don't normally use that title. <laughs> this one. Our school board attorney. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, School Board members, and Dr. Robertson. I'm Cammy Linetti, the school board attorney, and on behalf of the Policy Review Committee, I'll be representing, yes, 32 policies to you tonight that came out of the August 10th and August 14th, 2023 PRC meetings. I know this is a lot of policies. I just will remind you that part of our pro work program for the Policy Review Committee is to go through different sections. We were concluding Section 4. Because we did not have a meeting in July, we held up some of the policies, and those came on for us in the August meeting. In addition to the August meeting, based on the last school board meeting, the PRC was directed to look at some of the policies relevant to the 2023 model policies from VDOE that we will be talking about later tonight. That added the special meeting meeting on August 14th, which followed up with some of the stuff we were talking about on August 10th. So there are three additional policies. Before you panic, I will point out to you, most of these policies are minor scrivener changes, so we should be able to go through some of them pretty quickly. But again, these are just normal policies that we were going through. Our first up is policy 248. This is salaries and compensation. Apparently, we made a mistake that we had originally when we brought the policies to you in April, we were doing some of the policy review where we were taking Section 2 and Section 4 policies and changing them on recommendations. Somehow we got our wires crossed, and although we initially had repealed Policy 248 because it's now Policy 435, somehow it got back on in June and we approved it. It needs to come off again, so we need to make sure that's clear. This is Policy 248, which is salaries and compensation. This is actually Policy 435, so we're just going to move that the school board repeal this as we meant to do originally in April. Are there any questions on 248? Hearing no questions on 248, I will look at um, 447. This is nepotism and employment. The language recommendations here are to clarify language. You'll see some um, clarifications on school board versus school division, school member and superintendent, clarifications on when they take office. The significant change that comes is under Section B, under supervisor responsibility. The Human Resources Department is recommending a definition that says, for the purpose of this policy, direct supervisory responsibility means the person exercises control over the employment or the employment activities of another person or is in the position to influence another person's employment activities, and it goes on to say the employment and assignment of family members of the same organizational unit is discouraged. These were just clarifications that the Human Resource Department thought would help in implementing this particular policy. Other than that, there's some minor scrivener changes. Are there any questions on policy 47? Hearing no questions on policy 47, I will move to policy 49. This is health certificates, medical examinations, communicable diseases, and awareness, fitness for duty. The changes here that come are primarily in section B, which has to do with health certificates and medical examinations, clarifications on some of the rules we have for food service employees, and there are a couple minor scrivener changes uh, through the rest of the policy. Are there any questions on policy 49? Hearing no questions on policy 4.9, I will then move on to policy 4.10, which is conditions of employment. Conditions of employment has a minor um, clarification under section B, which is removing some necessary language, which has to do with discipline up to and including termination. They're going to recommend that it be separated from employment. A couple minor scrivener changes throughout the, the policy through there. There is an addition under, let's see, this is section G. I'm going to soon have about the fifth paragraph down. There has been a change in the state law involving offenses that need to um, require an employee um, cannot be certified that they have not been convicted of, and there's addition on the section that comes after the rape of a child, which will read, or the solicitation of any other offense. This is current updates on the law. Other than that, there are minor scrivener changes and no other significant changes. Are there any questions on policy 410? Hearing no questions on policy 410, we will move on to policy 411. There are only scrivener's errors and a removal of the editor's notes consistent with how we're currently doing policies. Other than that, there are no further recommended amendments to policy 411. Any questions on 411? Hearing no questions on 411, I will move on to 412, which is 412 is assignment, reassignment, transfer. There are a few minor scrivener changes you'll see in the first section. The significant change comes under section C, which is classified professional and non-instructional administrative section two under transfer. They're recommending, and after some consultation with the PRC, the language will now read two transfers, 
small subsection A, an employee may not request a transfer until after they have received their first evaluation, removing the rest of the language that had to do with a three months probationary period, and then we move on to subsection B. Are there any questions about policy 412? Hearing no questions on policy 412, I will move on to policy 413. The recommended change into policy 413 is uh, to combine the word in the title workdays. Other than that, there are no recommended changes, so it's merely a scrivener's change. Are there any questions on 413? Hearing no questions on 413, we will move on to policy 414. Again, there's simply scrivener's changes that you'll see throughout, a couple of corrections on combining words or correction punctuation on there and removing the editor's notes. But other than that, there are no significant changes recommended to policy 414, which is alternative work schedule, 12 month or non-instructional employees. Any further questions on policy 414? Hearing no questions on policy 414, I will move on to policy 420, which is reduction in force. There are simply scrivener's changes, correcting some punctuation or some grammatical errors. And that, other than that, there are no significant changes recommended to policy 420, reduction in force. Are there any questions on policy 420? Hearing no questions, I'll move on to policy 423. 423 is conflict of interest. Um, we did add some language in this area. As you may be aware, we are looking through the contracting process. Dr. Um, Robertson has begun that process with us, and we have several departments working on that. One of the areas we realize that we are continuing to have to improve is our training of our employees on the conflict of interest and making our language a little bit clearer. So the suggestion here would be what we originally took out. Many years ago, we actually put the whole conflict of interest law in there. We took that out, and we left the original language. You see it's roughly about two sentences. What we're proposing now is that we add language that will state, employees are responsible for ensuring that they are in compliance with both acts as well as any policies, regulations, or procedures that involve either act, which is the Conflict of Interest Act or the Ethics and Procurement Act. Employees who have or suspect they will have a personal interest in a contract with or a transaction with school board should consult with their supervisor, the Department of Finance, regarding compliance with law, policy, regulation, procedures, and then we recommend removing the editor's notes. Again, this is an area that we are looking at as part of our contracting process. We will be updating some of the rules and hopefully some better training for our employees so everyone is clear on these acts so that we are not in a situation where our employees are not fully aware of what they are required to comply with. But those are the recommendations we are going to recommend to 423 conflict of interest. Are there any questions? Okay, no questions on 423. I will move on to 433, which is investigative procedures. The only recommendations for changes are scrivener's changes, which would be the superintendent designee and removing the editor's notes. Are there any questions about policy 433? Okay, no questions on 4033. I will move on to policy 438, which is travel expenditures and reimbursements. There are only minor scrivener's changes, adding a few words in there. Other, there, other than that, there are no recommended changes to policy 438, travel expenditures and reimbursements. Are there any questions? Hearing no questions on 438, we'll move on to 442. The only recommendation of scrivener's changes, this is a property for, policy 442, is policy, property damage and reimbursement, and we're just recommending removing the editor's notes. Are there any questions? Any okay, no questions on 442, we'll move on to 445, which is sick leave banks. On this, we now have a sick leave bank. You will see it said banks before we were recommending we make one bank. As you may be aware, last year we combined it into one sick leave bank instead of multiples, and we're just updating the language to reflect that. So these are only scrivener's changes. Are there any questions on policy 445? Hey, no questions on 445, I'll move on to 449, which is military service. Only a minor scrivener's change in the middle of that um, sentence on military service, I'm sorry, in that paragraph on there. But other than that, there are no recommended changes under the policy 449 military service. Are there any questions? Hey, no questions, I will move on to 451. This is lawsuits and subpoenas. Again, as remember last year, we changed some of the policies referring to the Department of Legal Service and the change in my title and position. We needed to update again this policy to reflect the change of, so as you're no longer represented by the city attorney's office. So most of the changes in here have to do with correcting the terminology for the current attorney situation. Also some clarification in here having to do with when you have outside retained counsel that represents you. Certain times we've clarified some of that language. We've also down in section B having to do with witness subpoenas 
clarified some of the rules on when who can accept a witness subpoena on, school, on the behalf of school board members, clarifying the fact that you do have retained counsel and insurance counsel sometimes representing you other than the school board attorney's office. We've also reflected that sometimes we have former school board members, as you can replace school board members every election or through appointment, and those persons in their official capacity may be subject to lawsuits and that we can accept law subpoenas on their behalf. So we're just clarifying that language for you. Other than that, you're just going to see but what I would call Scrivener's changes through the rest of this policy. Are there any questions on policy 451? There are no questions on policy 451. We will move on to policy 457, which is licensed personnel contracts. The clarification in this particular policy comes under section A under contracts. HR, the Human Resource Department is recommending that we put in a definition for temporarily employed persons. So temporarily employed teacher means one, who is employed to substitute for a contracted teacher for a temporary period of time during the contracted teacher's absence, or two, one who is employed to fill a teacher's vacancy for a period of time but no longer than 90 teaching days in this such capacity, and unless otherwise approved by the superintendent of public administration on a case-by-case -case basis during a one-year period. There are some recommended scrivener's changes throughout the rest of that, but that is a clarification that Human Resources is recommending at this time. There's some updates to the legal references that are also in there. Other than that, there are no further recommendations. Are there any questions on policy 457? I'm sorry, Ms. Anderson? Be sure to point out um, at the bottom of um, this policy, it says during the 2023, 24, and 24, 24, 25 school years, the school board may employ a temporarily employed teacher to fill such a vacancy for a period of time not to exceed 180 days during one school year. Yes, ma'am, and that is what the General Assembly has been providing some leniency for school divisions in the last couple of years. We expect that to stay in for the next couple of years, and that could be updated depending on what the General Assembly does. Are there any questions on 457 other than Ms. Anderson's? Hearing no questions on 457, I will move on to policy 465, which is meeting and conferences. There is only a minor scrivener's change under uh, punctuation. I, we have reviewed under the bottom part, reviewed by school board, that should actually be amended. I will fix that before it comes back for the um, consent agenda. But are there any other questions on policy 465, meetings and conferences? <coughs> If no questions on policy 465, I'll move on to policy 467. Inve investigating, reporting alcohol, marijuana, or illegal drug use. We'll see uh, corrections in here because there are changes in law having to do with marijuana. We have gone to head and added that into this particular policy to reflect that and changes and updated into the legal references. Are there any questions about policy 467? Um, Ms. Queen, Ms. did you also go oh, through 465? 466. Uh-oh. Okay, 466, sorry. That's a good question. What did it, oh, move to Tutoring you. personnel, 466. Correct, I went a little too fast that time. 466, which is tutoring for pay. Tutoring for pay, after discussing with the policy review committee, we did add a change from the policy review committee on this section. So the initial recommendation from Human Resources was to add the words um, designee. After some discussion with the Policy Review Committee, they wanted some clarification on when you could and couldn't use tutors. So in the last sentence in the first paragraph, teachers are not to advise that students be tutored, and the Policy Review Committee is recommending to add the words, by paid tutors without prior consultation with the principal. And those are the recommendations coming both from the Policy Review Committee and the Human Resources Department. Are there any further questions on Policy 466? All right, let's move past the wagon. With any questions on 467 on the investigating reporting marijuana, illegal drug use? Going to policy 468, reporting child abuse and neglect. The only recommended changes here are scrivener's changes and update to the legal reference. Are there questions about reporting child abuse or neglect policy 468? Hearing no questions on policy 468, we'll look at policy 470. This is licensed personnel, teacher salary scale. There are just some clarifying language in here, and this will appear in the second sentence. The salary scale should be competitive in order to attract and retain highly qualified teachers. It should take into consideration years of school base or relevant central office, job-related experience, and degree of educational attainment or other such criteria by the school board. We're just moving the words around here, but not a significant change. Are there any questions about policy 470, licensed personnel, teacher salary scale? 
Hearing no questions on policy 470, we'll look at 473. Awards for achievement in a service, a minor scrivener's change, and the addition of the words. There. Other than that, there are no further recommended amendments to this policy. Any questions on 473? Hearing no questions on 473, we'll look at policy 483, classified personnel, similar to the last policy. Minor scrivener changes here that are recommended on there, just clarifying language. Other than that, there are no recommended changes to policy 483, classified personnel evaluation. Are there any questions? Hearing no questions on 483, I'll move on to 485. This is classified personnel, meetings, conferences, and Conventions or some clarifying language, removing la um, language in the first, second sentence, classified personnel who wish to attend meetings, conferences, or conventions may do so under regulations approved by the school division. And minor scrivener change after that. And there, that, there are no further recommended changes. Are there any questions about policy 485? Hearing no questions on 485, we will look at policy 486, which is classified personnel compensation. There are no recommended changes, so this would just be up for review for the five-year mandatory review. Any questions about policy 486? Look, moving on to policy 487, overtime. Again, there are no recommended changes. I think there's some formatting changes, but other than that, there are no significant changes recommended. So this, again, would be a review by the school board as required by the five-year requirement. Are there any questions on policy 487, overtime? Hearing no questions on policy 487, I'll move on to policy 491, observation students, practicum students, student teachers, and interim. The changes you recommended here, although there's some scrivener changes in section B, the section C is supervision of practicum students, student teachers, and interns. There is a clarification that the have the licensure requirements, removing the dates from the five year to 10 year renewable license that appears in section C1C. And then that there are no other recommended changes to this policy, which is 491. Are there any questions on policy 491? Hearing no questions on 491, I will move on to 492, which is summer teachers, assignments, and placements. There are just some clarifying languages in the second paragraph, clarifying when you will make the information available and how you will inform individuals. Other than that, there are no significant changes other than the clarifying language in the second paragraph. Again, this is policy 492, summer school teachers, assignment, and placement. Are there any questions? Any no questions on policy 492, I'll move on to policy 497, which is administrative interns, administrative assistance. We did some formatting changes to this, which is to add some subsections and clarifying language, but there are no significant changes recommended to 497. Are there any questions on policy 497? Any no questions on 497, we're going to move on to policy 4. Policy 5.9. Policy 5.9 is not in, uh, in your personnel section. This is in your student section. Uh, this is relevant to a change that the General Assembly put through a law. The General Assembly put through a law this year that appears in Code of Virginia 22.1369 involves educational opportunities for certain federal employees. You may be aware of the Interstate Compact for the Education of Military Dependents and Military Children. That imposes certain rules that we have to follow. When 22.1369 was enacted this year, it offers the same opportunities and same programs available for certain federal contractors. So we've just gone ahead and added that section in here. So under the last sentence, it will now be an applicable state law regarding children of certain federal employees. So this is to comply with new current law that's available. Are there any questions about policy 5.9? Okay, so those are the recommendations that came out originally out of PRC. The next three policies will have to do with the information coming out at the last school board meeting. You asked the policy review committee to start looking for policies that are rel that might need to be changed in rel in to be compliant with the 2023 model policies from VDOE regarding transgender students. One of the ones we looked at first was policy 5.7 which is non-discrimination, non-harassment of students. While we did not see a reason to change anything it's substantive in this particular policy, remember this is not just having to do transgender students, this has to do with our overall policies on non-discrimination, non-harassment of students. We point, the PRC pointed out that in paragraph A, towards the end of the paragraph, um, the second to last sentence, it references the actual name of the uh, policies, the 2021 policies recommended by the VDOE. So the recommendation is to change this policy to be the superintendent's designee is directed to develop regulations, practices, and trainings related to compliance with Code of Virginia 22.123.3 as amended and take out the reference to the actual name of the policy as that may change. And that would be the only recommendation we are going to make having to do with policy 5-7. Are there any questions about the recommendation on policy 5-7? 
Hearing no questions on the recommendation for policy 5-7, I will move on to policy 531. PRC was looking at the model 2023 policies involving the transgender students, and we were trying to figure out where we would put in recommendations having to do with the definitions that you see in the 2023 policies. After looking at it, the PRC is recommending that we look at policy 531, which is scholastic records, and there are definitions. Currently, we have a definition of eligible student, which is being required by the 2023 policy. We already have that definition in. It's a little bit more expansive in our definition, but that definition exists. The recommendation coming out of PRC was that we add the definition of parent, and that would be parent or parents, mean any parent, guardian, legal custodian, or other person having control or charge of a child. The child is determined to be a person under the age of 18 years of age. Students who are eligible students or adult students, as used in the school division, have the right to make decisions regarding their records and education. The recommendation coming out of PRC is to add this definition, and that's the only recommendation we are making to Policy 531 at this time. Are there any other questions about Policy 531? Mr. Culpepper? One real question. Is that the only change to this policy, is just adding that paragraph? That is what came out of the PRC, yes. That is a recommendation out of the PRC. Okay. Uh, seems a little redundant with the previous paragraph, and that's not really a big deal. Was this policy unanimous coming out of the uh, PRC? Was this policy unanimous coming out no, of the No, it was a two-to-one decision. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there any Ms. further Brown. questions? Yeah, so um, my colleagues and I were able to agree on many policies, obviously, and get a lot of work done. Um, but I was unable to support um, policy 5-31 student records. Um, the initial recommendation was to, after talking to administration, to add the word sex to mean biological sex to be consistent with the model policies for 2023. And um, the definition of transgender student shall mean a public school student whose parent has stated in writing that the student's gender differs from the student's sex or an eligible student who states in writing that his or her gender differs from his or her sex. Um, there was some talk about potentially removing parents. Um, that didn't happen. But um, I ultimately did not support this because I believe it circumvents the intention of the model policies. Thank you. Mr. Callan. Ms. Linetti, in Section B, the beginning of the second paragraph, help me understand something. It, it reads as follows. An accurate and complete individual, permanent, and cumulative record shall be maintained for each student in grades pre-K through 12 enrolled in the school division. Here's my question. When appropriate, a separate confidential record shall be maintained for those students requiring differentiated. Mm, that's good. Seems that's like there's a word missing, yes. A word missing or something. I think it's supposed to be differentiated instruction because my understanding is I think that applies to special ed. So yeah, that, that's a good catch, Mr. Callan. Yeah, thank you. What for your Under my benefit, what was the answer to oh, I'm sorry, I believe the I believe it's missing the word instruction, which Correct. generally because we usually keep our special education records in separate files on there, and I think that's what, and I can go back and check that. I will verify that for okay. you. Okay. Thank you. I agree with that. <laughs> I, and that's just something we didn't catch. You don't see it? It's the second sentence in uh, Second paragraph, B, second sentence, it's the end of the word we're missing. It appears we're missing a word. I will go back and check that if for any reason it is not that, and I don't believe it is, because I believe that specifically refers to special education, that that's, and that's normally the terminology we use for special education. I will verify that, but I will get that information back to the school board. At this time, that is all the recommendations coming out of PRC. At this time, we have no further questions. Are there anything, anything else I can answer for you, or can the members of the PRC answer for you? One more, one more quick one for me. Yes, sir. Ms. Owens. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, for the benefit of uh, the board, because I know there was a question uh, by Mr. Culpepper about 
uh, unanimous, and uh, Ms. Brown was able to share uh, where her vote differed. Uh, the, during the discussions, uh, the only place that the policy committee uh, seemed to differ for that for this policy was in the section about definitions. Uh, uh, Ms. Brown referenced that there was discussion about removing the definition of parents. Um, and for context with that uh, conversation in talking with administration and those uh, in the room, there is no place in our policy that references trans the term transgender student. And so there was a discussion as to do we need the definition of a term that's not located in that policy. Um, typically when we are defining a, a word in the beginning of the policy, it's so that it can be understood how it's being used in that policy. And if the word doesn't exist in the policy, then does the definition need to be provided at the beginning of the policy? Um, and there was some question as to whether you needed a definition for parents as there has never really been confusion in the, the district about what a parent is. And so just wanted to provide kind of the context of uh, some of the conversation with that uh, definition section. Mr. Culpepper? Yeah, I, I want to address that other than to say I think it's going to come up again a year later. Um, I did read in one of these other, uh, I think it's actually a regulation uh, where it says counseling records are also kept separately. Should that be included in paragraph B in that same, same piece? Um, I think when a separate, I think you'd go on to the next sentence. When a separate confidential file is established, a rotation on community location confidential record on that. Okay, that general confidential record covers that. I think so. I'll, I'll check with Mr. Jamison if there's any other reason why we separate those records out differently. There are certainly records that are kept in different locations for different reasons. Okay. Health records are going to be kept in the health clinic and other issues that are confidential. But I'll check with Mr. Jamison to make sure we're properly using the terminology for the records. Thank you. At this time, that will conclude the presentation for the PRC for the August meetings. Thank you, Ms. Lanetti. So that brings us to um, C, when uh, I amended the adoption of the agenda and added C, recommendation to fill the vacant at-large governance seat. Um, and just a, a quick explanation again, um, when the PRC um, met and they adopted our nominated a new um, PRC chair. That PRC chair happened to be the fifth member, which was the at-large governance seat. So she moved off of that seat because she will fill the PRC seat on the governance. That left that vacant. I asked um, Mrs. Brown if she would be interested in taking that seat, and she said yes, she would. So I am recommending to fill that vacant at-large governance seat with Kathleen Brown. Okay. Any other discussion? Anybody else want to talk about it or ask any questions? Okay. No, just thank you for stepping up. I appreciate that. I, I really appreciate it, too. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we're going to move back um, to, we're going to return to our public comments, and these are the um, virtual comments. We're on 13. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first online speaker is Paula Chang. Please unmute. Okay, now it does. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, please go, Mrs. Chang. Thank you. Um, I might suggest some people look at the Virginia Human Rights Act 2.2-3904. The decision regarding the model policies is not complicated. It is logical, obvious, and simple because you all swore an oath to the U.S. Constitution. 
Our Virginia Code in the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution acknowledged the God-given, not government-granted, unalienable parental rights in the raising of their children and thus, by extension, the rights of each child. Though you swore an oath to uphold the U.S. Constitution, the Northman administration and this school board disregarded Virginia Code, the U.S. Constitution, and these unalienable parental and individual rights when they adopted the Northam era model policies. Those here who supported the Northam policies actively participated in the stripping of parental rights and created the chaos we see here week after week as parents and citizens come here to fight to regain what the government attempted to strip away from them. The new Yunkin era policies, as written, follow both Virginia Code and the U.S. Constitution and are the necessary step in the Commonwealth of Virginia's return to recognition of these unalienable parental and individual rights. With parental rights come parental responsibilities and fulfillment of responsibilities require parents to have all the information they need regarding their child. Those on this board who choose to vote against or to alter the Yunkin administration model policies are deliberately choosing to continue to erode the rights and thus the responsibility of parents. You do not get to pick and choose exactly which parts of unalienable parental rights you will acknowledge. Board members who work to subvert Yunkin's model policies under false pretenses of protecting the student-teacher bond are in fact stay, saying then that the student-teacher bond is superior to the bond of the parent and the child. And you are wrong. And we all see through this ploy of control. You are not trying to help the students or the teacher because there is no decision to be made as the teachers whom I do respect have responsibility to the parent. The teacher does not have any decision-making authority over the parent and the parent-child bond. The ultimate authority over the child is the parents, not the teachers, not the governments, and not the Virginia Beach school boards. At a June meeting, Mrs. Riggs stated that when the policies, model policies were re released, they would be adopted. Well, they are released, and they do follow the law. They do protect- 30 seconds and individual parental rights. So now do the right thing, pass the 2023 model policies as written, honor your oath to the US Constitution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dan Chang, please unmute. Mrs. Riggs, can you hear me? You can proceed, Mr. Chang. At the 10th September Policy Review Committee, Dr. Robertson and Mr. Jamison, Executive Director of Student Support, addressed the Yunkin model policies of 2023. Both agreed the policies were workable. And both have been working together, developing procedures to move forward with the new model policies. Their procedures, as presented that day, were extremely reasonable and balanced. Dr. Robertson asked for trust to move forward with the Yunkin policies. Thus far, that has not happened. There has been delays as certain school board members politically posture. This delay has cost, has had costs on our school system. School starts next week, and these direct and clear policies available to this board in July has still not been approved. This makes difficult a smoother implementation of these changes before the start of the year. You wasted valuable development and training time, such as last week's teachers' training while members on this board try but fail to create diversionary tactics in an attempt to develop some pseudo plausible reason to reject these policies. It is not working. You try to maintain control by justifying the hiding of altered student names and gender preferences from parents as reasonable when you absolutely know this is wrong. What, what you are doing is not honest. You think we don't see this, but we do. There is a popular song sweeping the nation called Rich Men North of Richmond. The song talks about just such subversive attempts at control. The song references national control, but such, such control absolutely requires actions at the local level, including the school board. In order to have that control, the government must insert itself where it does not belong, such as by interfering in parental rights and hope we do not catch on what you're actually trying to do, control us. We have spent the last year we are using diversionary transgender policy, which affects a tiny minute percentage of students, which belongs with the family, not the school board. You divert attention from real failures on issues, which is your responsibility. 100% of the students are affected by academics. 
100% of the students are affected by discipline and behavior issues. 100% are affected by teacher and staff support retention. There is much more, the fentanyl and the drug problem and pornography. Pass the policy and get on with what you are actually elected to do. To paraphrase this song, 30 seconds. you're not fooling us. You think we don't see what you're doing, but we do. Pass the resolution and pass Governor Youngkin's 2023 model policy. Thank you. Our next speaker is Suzanne Saltesiak. Please unmute. Hello, my name is Suzanne and I am the parent of two high schoolers in Virginia Beach schools. One previous speaker asked you to listen to the parents and keep them involved. However, I have noticed not many of these adults presenting here have identified as actual current parents of students. Hmm. So interesting that while we are talking about parents' rights, I have only heard two actual current parents asking for them tonight. And I've heard the same amount of parents asking you not to pass this resolution. Maybe it's not about parents' rights. I hear a lot more speakers talking about religion, so maybe it's actually about imposing religious values on students. You hear a few speakers mention the existing state law referencing the part that says school boards need to adopt policies as more comprehensive than the model policies. But whoops, are they picking and choosing the only part of the law that they like? Maybe they need to read the parts about compliance with non-discrimination laws, protection of student privacy and prevention of discrimination. So the regulations that Dr. Spence put into place are more comprehensive in ensuring student privacy non-discrimination, so they meet that. Our school board gave the direction to the superintendent or designee to be in compliance with the law. So should this resolution pass or should it fail and the acting superintendent decides to go against the votes of this board, I have several questions. What about my parental rights? Since the actual parents here tonight and over time seem split about 50-50 on this, it seems the most appropriate, given that half of these parents want the policy and half don't, that we need to have options available for all. So I will be asking for my parental rights to be honored and to opt out of any regulations created as a result of the model policies. I have already sent my requests for an opt-out form to my school counselors and administrators, administrators and know of several people who have done the same. How will you document the parental rights determination of parents that do not want their children's rights to be taken away? if they don't want to be notified that their child just wants to go by different pronouns or a different nickname? Where will the form be located? When will we have access to it? Will it be an opt-in or an opt-out? Will it change based upon the dependent age and if they've reached the age of consent in Virginia? If a student dies by suicide, is abused or kicked out of their house after being outed by the schools, or they and their family decide to sue the district, who is liable? Is our teachers, our staff, our school counselors? What if a student is uh, was out last year at school and is now forced back into the closet this year by the policy. 30 seconds. Are the counselors and teachers still required to out them this year? Why is this being implemented by school counselors? This puts school counselors' relationships with some of the most vulnerable students in our schools at risk during a time that they will be most needed. Many of our school counselors are also licensed counselors or LCSWs, and I know not providing informed consent about this is an ethical violation. Has the district verified this with their licensing boards? I have many more, but I'm out of time. I plan to send you a letter. Thank you and very much. And that is time. Our next speaker is Dolores Pafitis. Please unmute. Dolores, please unmute. Last time, Dolores, please unmute. We'll move on to our next online speaker, Vic Nichols, please unmute. Can you hear? Go ahead, Ms. Nichols, thank you. Thank you. I support Vicki Manning's resolution as per Dr. Lisa Coons. School boards that are like not to do so assume all legal responsibility for noncompliance. 31 examples in less than two months of trans issues and violence, like a Gettysburg Area School District trans tennis coach, 
who changed clothes with a very shocked and upset varsity girls soccer team. Evidence given to the UK Parliament, trans women were over six times more likely to be convicted of an offense than females and 18 times more likely to be convicted of a violent offense. In one once prisoner stance, 76 sex offenders of 129 trans women is 58.9%. 125 sex offenders of 3,812 women is 3.3%. 13,234 sex offenders of 78,781 men is 16.8%. Males IDing as trans exhibit a high in male, male propensity to commit sexual crimes. The amount of incorrect statements from minors shows why they shouldn't be listened to. If you want adult rights, assume their responsibilities, including speaking when adults do. This gotta go next school next day excuse. Adults have to go to work early on the kids. It doesn't work during the summer. It's a control issue by unethical board members for political purposes. Minors aren't capable of balancing rights and responsibilities between varied groups. None mention rights of minor females to not be raped or one sex might be uncomfortable being in a formerly safe space with the opposite sex. The vote will show who's childlike, pack fowler, wasteful, and hypocritical given they follow Northam's VDOE policies. When a shirt has protect trans kids and a knife in it, it's an implied threat. We'd have done it, you'd have thrown us out. Kids haven't liked being under their parents' control since Cain hid from Adam and Eve. Parents have their kids' best interest at heart, not adults who use them for their own ideologies and unethical and immoral ends. Kids joke on each other. I was four eyes. I graduated salutatorian in my class with two college degrees. When they, you're the last of a line of kids, you get called everything. My name became a curse word for parents mad because they couldn't get my name straight because they were calling everyone out. It doesn't always lead to mental health issues or suicide. Stop the drama, back to reality, teach academics and logic. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laura Hughes. Please unmute. Hi, it was nice seeing Mr. Combs speak tonight. His mother was my faculty advisor in law school and a ferocious advocate for families. The Virginia Beach School Board has an obligation to adopt the model policies. Vincent Smith earlier went over this this evening and I will not rehash all of that because he was pretty spot on there. Um, as it is mentioned at every meeting, anyone can be sued at any time. The ability to sue someone or an entity does not make it a valid cause of action. Ms. Linetti has repeated this multiple times at multiple meetings, and it is shocking to see that the fear of being sued is being used as a reason to disobey the law. That really makes no sense whatsoever. The movement against the model policies was an agenda prior to them even being released. And worse, our children are being used to push harmful agendas. A resolution to undermine a policy before even knowing what was in the policy is clearly not logical or rational. We have children claiming that they will be unsafe if they are treated like everyone else. No one has given a single example of danger to children in schools. Sadly, people with agendas have convinced children that any difference of opinion is unsafe. And these children are being set up for failure because they're being taught that any form of disagreement, anyone who may not like you is a danger. This will severely handicap them in life as they will have a very difficult time interacting with diverse people whatsoever. I would like to address the right to privacy that was mentioned earlier. There was a, um, a child who mentioned the right to privacy in the 14th Amendment, and that's actually not there. And frankly, children do not have an inherent right of privacy from their parents. I do agree, however, as someone stated earlier, that the weight of judgment um, on gender identity should not fall to school staff. It falls to parents. It should not be on the school staff at all. <laughs> know that it falls to parents. Parents have the final decision in everything with their children. School staff is secondary. When school personnel do anything that undermines parental rights, they are overstepping their bounds. Parents, not teachers, not administrators, not government officials, they, they make decisions for their own children. Parents make decisions for their own children. No one else has any right to overstep that whatsoever. 
A child used having a driver's license as an example of autonomy. However, as I recall, I needed to sign something to allow my minor children to get driver's licenses. And when we went to court to get them, the judge explained that I could take that away at any time by asking the court to remove such. Schools and the government are not co-parents. Children do not always know what is best for them. And it is time that all of you on that dais acknowledge that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Dean. Please unmute. Good evening. I have made my presentation succinct due to the lateness of the hour. Let's say you're taking your son or daughter to soccer or band practice, or you have a group of kids that you're shuttling somewhere and you purposely run a red light or blow through a stop sign, and one of your children points out what you did. What do you say? Just imagine the impact your answer will have on the other children in the car and what they'll tell their parents. Or on your trip to stop at a 7-Eleven, pick up a beer and begin drinking it while driving in front of the kids. Drawing a correlation between those examples and tonight's vote on coming together in one accord in support of Governor Yunkin's and the Virginia Department of Education's Policy 2023, what I will call Articles of Conduct and Decency, brings up your commitment to follow the rules of the road which in this case runs through our Virginia Beach school system. In the military, we have the Uniform Code of Military Justice that guides the behavior of our servicemen and women. And you know when you take that oath to serve and defend, your conduct has consequences. Perhaps that is what's lacking in our government schools, as evidenced by the small number of former military members serving in the classrooms. Once you have served, you are part of a different culture of discipline, something woefully lacking in our system. Could it stem from what is also lacking on this board, the commitment to follow the law? You there sitting on that stage seem to have forgotten that you also took an oath when you took office. Here's a reminder. I do solemnly swear, swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge all the duties incumbent upon me as a school board member, according to the best of my ability, so help me God. Those aren't just a bunch of words thrown together. They have intrinsic and extrinsic meaning, in this case, following the law. If you vote against the 2023 policy, you are setting a dramatic example to the students in our system that you are above the law and you can pick and choose which laws you want to follow. In closing, have the guts to support the laws of Virginia. And once you do, give the administration their marching orders. Follow the law or look for employment elsewhere. Vote tonight to approve these governing 2023 policies. For the public record, my name is Robert Dean and my phone number is 287-8694. Have a nice evening. Speaker eight is not online. We're gonna to try to go back to speaker number four. Dolores Pafitis, please unmute. Dolores, please unmute. Okay. okay, Madam Chair, we're having a difficulty, so that was our last speaker for this evening. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So now we're going to return back to our agenda, um, the consent agenda 14. On the consent agenda are the resolution for one, National Hispanic Heritage Month, and two, Suicide Prevention Week. B, school board organizational matters, superintendent's designee in the absence of the superintendent, and two, superintendent's signature authority. Are there any objections to the school board voting on the consent agenda items? If so, please identify any item that should be moved to the action agenda. Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna call for um, a motion to approve all of the items on the consent agenda as presented. We will, but I have to get the Okay, Ms. Weems, and do I have a second? Seconded by Mrs. Um, 
Anderson. Okay, so before we vote, I need to uh, have our readers read the resolution. And for one, National Hispanic Heritage Month, Kim Melnick. Estoy aprendiendo español y me gusta practicar español todos los días. Entonces, um, I work hard every day at my Spanish, so it is my honor to read um, the National Hispanic Heritage Month. Whereas one of our nation's greatest strengths is its vast diversity, which enables Americans to see the world from many viewpoints. And whereas National Hispanic Heritage Month honors the cultures and contributions of both Latino and Hispanic Americans. And whereas Latino and Hispanic Americans embrace a deep commitment to family, community, and education, and perseverance to succeed and contribute to the shaping of the country and our city of Virginia Beach. And whereas the 2023 Hispanic Heritage Month observance theme, Latinos Driving Prosperity, Power, and Progress in America, invites us to reflect on the contributions Latino and Hispanic Americans have made in the past and will continue to make in the future. And whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach recognizes the importance of culturally responsive education that embraces multicultural diversity within our school division. Now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach officially recognizes September 15th through October 15th as National Hispanic Heritage Month. And be it further resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach encourages all citizens to support and participate in the various school activities available during National Hispanic Heritage Month. And be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board, adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach this 22nd day of August, 2023. Thank you. And for um, Suicide Prevention Week, Ms. Jessica Owens. Thank you. Resolution for Suicide Prevention Week, September 11th through 15th of 2023. Whereas suicide is the 11th leading cause of death in the United States and the third leading cause of death among individuals between the ages of 15 to 19, and whereas suicide is now the 10th leading cause of death in the state of Virginia, and whereas suicide strikes without regard to locality, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, religious preference, or age, and Whereas in the United States, one person dies by suicide every 11 minutes. And whereas education and community involvement are known to be the most crucial factors in preventing suicide. And whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach is focused on ways to educate students, parents, and school staff about suicide and prevention of suicide and whereas Virginia Beach City Public Schools, through sustained and dedicated efforts, has implemented programs for all employees and students that recognize a deep commitment at all levels to raise awareness of suicide and its prevention. Now therefore be it resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach designates the week of September 11th to the 15th, 2023 as Suicide Prevention and Awareness Week in the Virginia Beach City Public Schools and be it further resolved that strategies and activities to address suicide prevention and suicidal behaviors be ongoing in Virginia Beach City Public Schools and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board, adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach this 22nd day of August, 2023. Thank you, Ms. Owens. Okay, so we have a motion um, to adopt the consent agenda in a second. So all in favor, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. Now we're on the action agenda, personnel report, administrative appointments. A call for a motion to approve the August 22nd, 2023 personnel report and administrative appointments. Do I have a motion? Ms. Franklin and seconded by 
Ms. Anderson. Um, any discussion? Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Manning. So um, I had a discussion with Dr. Robertson about this um, a few days ago, and um, while I support the people who've been selected for these positions, there is one position for which um, I inquired in more detail about the salary. Um, I'm not sure, maybe Ms. Linetti can guide me on how much I can actually say about the position and, and what the salary is. Is that something I can discuss openly now, or do I need to be vague? The salary that goes with the position is available under the Freedom Information Act, but if you're negotiating, you haven't worked out a salary at this point, I'm not sure you can speak specific to this so position. So we haven't approved it yet, so technically we're still in negotiations? If you may, I, I'm not sure if I know which one you're talking about, but I'm not sure if you're still in the negotiation stage. Once the person's hired under the Freedom Information Act, if they make more than $10,000, that information is available to them, but to the public. But at this point, if you're still negotiating, that's not an issue, then it may still not be available. It may be a personal record. Okay. I'll keep it vague. Do you think that's probably appropriate, Ms. Dr. Robertson? Um, so I, I compared this position um, in another government organization, and the position shows that it makes between 109 and 168. Um, and we're offering well above that for this position. And while I believe that the person is very good and very competent and I support that person being chosen, I just, it's no secret that I've had issues with the, the salary levels that we're offering of certain positions. And um, I, just, I just can't support it. I think we need to come back and, and have a more balanced um, pay scale for our senior administration. And um, this person, I believe, is being started out at the same amount as the person leaving. So. Um, I do have some concerns about that, and that's the reason why I cannot support this administration, administrative um, recommendations. Thank you. Okay, no other conversation. Seeing none, um, I call for a vote on the uh, personnel report, administrative appointments. All in favor, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have five ayes. Okay, all that are against the administrative appointments, please raise your hand. And we have five nays, so it's an, it, it did not, it, the motion failed. And Ms. Martin is not online. Okay. So, um, I know Dr. Robertson has, do you have any administrative appointments? Madam Chair, if I may, mm -hmm. can you address this, Dr. Robertson? Like, what do we do now? I've never seen this happen. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate concern over the salary of the individual you recommended to replace uh, Ms. Allen. It's almost like the inflation conversation that we had with City Council related to PPEA and the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. Ms. Allen is leaving in two weeks. And Julie Braley's leaving in two weeks. We will be crippled in the Department of Communications and Community Engagement for at least four to six weeks as we reopen this position and lower the salary. We will not get the same quality individual. It will not happen. I need this board to understand the impact of communications. It is dire. 
And this individual um, I don't even know what to say. Well, if I may, as chair of the audit committee, I will tell you that we had an auditor. Madam Chair, point of order, we've already had discussion on this topic and a vote. Um, I don't think we should be having more discussion on it. Okay, then I'll withdraw, but I don't want to be responsible for the crippling of this of, of Madam Chair, point of order. Okay, thank you. Do we have any of these recommendations that have been approved? No, the motion on the floor has been, unless you amend your agenda, that motion is over with. And because you had a split vote, you can't reopen it because it has to be somebody in the majority. So unless you amend your agenda to do something else, you don't have any motion on the floor to deal with any of the positions at the moment. Okay, so none of our, these positions. Could I amend the agenda to approve all of the positions other than that one? You'd be amending the agenda add 15, I believe it's, I guess it's going to be, if you're changing B or, sorry, is it C? I'm trying to be, it's what A, we 15 do? A. It's 15 A. Well, that's done. You're going to have to amend your agenda to add a new motion, and it would be 15 D to, to because you can't reopen the okay. boat with I'm, this. Uh, okay, I, I move that we uh, amend the agenda and add an action uh, 15 D. That will include all administrative appointments in the personnel report other than the media and communications position. Point of order, Madam Chair. Point of order. Sorry. Um, I motion that we um, move a reconsideration vote, removing that particular position so that we can vote on this um, since I was in the, oh, we didn't have a majority. We had a I, just, yeah, I just yeah. need a motion, all right, thank you. so I need a, a new second. motion. So what, what appears that Mrs. Manning did is amended the agenda add action item 15D, which would be to approve the administrative appointment except for the media and communications position. So she would need a second on that, to add, and that's you're amending the agenda. You're not moving to that yet. Correct. I'm sorry, it should be 15D because C is your um, governance committee appointment, so it would be 15D. Second. So Mr. Culpepper seconded it. Ms. Um, Manning, would you please restate your... Yeah, I move to amend the agenda to add an action item 15D that will include the personnel report, report, approval of the personnel report and administrative appointments except for the media and communications position. Now discussion on amending the agenda. Okay, so, and did we have, we had a second, which yes, was um, Mr. Culpepper. Mr. Culpepper. Now we need discussion. Um, on amending the agenda. On the amendment. My motion. Of the motion. I can't hear it. I can't hear what's going on down here, Madam Chair. She's trying to find out what she can um, speak about. Right now, the only Ms. it's only Mrs. Manning's motion, which are the remaining positions, not the media and communications. If you want to comment on those, that's what you'll be doing at this time, or offering another amendment. Okay. Any other discussion on the amend amendment, Mrs. Owens? Just for clarification, at this point, the, the discussion is just about the amendment, the uh, agenda. Then we're going to make a motion on the, the, okay. Nope, I'll wait until the next motion. Okay, so this amendment is to add D and to amend the agenda to include the recommendations of um, the personnel, except for uh, the one that media and communications. Media and communications. Okay. Everybody understand that? Okay. So I need to vote on this. Everyone who uh, wants to vote for this amendment, please raise your hand. 
Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes, so that, that motion by uh, Ms. Manning did pass. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to go to, we're on C. Okay. Right? Yeah, we finished B. B on your appointment to the governor's. Well, on item oh, I'm B. sorry, you're right. Sorry, jumped over B. I scribbled the wrong one. Sorry. Okay. So I called for a vote to approve the consent agenda as presented. Got, sorry, I'm on the wrong page. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Resolution for the model policy. I'll get it right. Okay, so we um, have the resolution for the model policies on ensuring privacy, dignity, and respect for all students and parents in Virginia's public schools. So we're open for a, a motion. Ms. Manning? Made the motion. Do I have a second? Ms. Brown? Okay. So now we need a discussion. Ms. Melnick? Okay. So, um, Mrs. Linetti, if we vote on this resolution, which actually puts everything in motion tonight, um, it directs the superintendent or designee to replace the entire current regulation 5-7.1 with the 2023 model policies for Virginia Beach City Public Schools. So if that happens and we vote on this resolution, then the model policies are adopted as is and it takes away our right to vote next school board meeting when it's up for um, action. Right? It's on action now. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. If, yeah, but the model, but we discussed earlier with our, with our policies is on for information. We discussed this policy and information we discussed policy we 5 7. On PRC, you did two policies, 5 7. And all we did with 5 7 was remove the title of the model policies, as that seems to change. So that's only change in 5 7. 531 is student records. That mm -hmm. is where we have the definitions. That might be something that might be inconsistent, or we're going to have to deal with. If, if you would adopt tonight this resolution, which includes a draft of the model policies, it does on its first section definition have definition. So you would have this there, and then we would have to figure out what we're going to do with policy 531. We just have to figure out. So it's out removing our right. It's, it, it, it's taking away our ability to vote on, on these two policies that were presented tonight in information, because this is going to trump everything. I'm not sure it's going to affect policy 5.7. I don't think policy 5.7 is affected. 5.31, we will have to look at what do we do. We would have to figure out what the next step is. 5.31 it would be if these are, if the model policies become adopted as part of this resolution. We just, we will just have to figure out between now and, and policy, and next week, next meeting, how we handle po regulate policy 5.31 student records. Okay, but. We've also made just a few slight changes. So my whole, my, no, we made some modifications. So this is as is, as the governor presented it, and we needed a few modifications, in, including your um, legal opinion. So we did a pretty good job. I mean, this, we were in compliance with everything, and we made a few modifications. And we have to remember that this is a very large school division, and 
a lot of work was put into this, um, and nothing is against the model policies, just a few tweaks that, that fit our division. And I think it would be reckless to approve this resolution as it is. It just kind of negates all the work that was done. Six hours of policy review on just the governor's model policies that were brought forward. I will say that I'm not sure we were absolutely consistent with the 2023 policies. We were discussing some of those areas. When policy review is being forth policies, there are some regulations we would need to deal with. We're not that far off, but not there were certain things we needed to deal with that we hadn't resolved. What you saw coming forward with policy review was only policies. We didn't bring the regulations okay. to you at this point. And I think that's what Dr. Robertson was trying to work for. I believe Dr. Robertson and his staff are trying to figure out what direction you want them to go so we can adjust pol regulations to be consistent with what, you're, what you want to do. So there are, you can adopt these, the proposed 2020 regulations with the changes that Mrs. Manning has made. You're just going to have to figure out if everything in there is exactly the way you want to say it or whether you want to make some changes. And that's something we haven't worked through all those details yet. Well, that last part concerns me then. We haven't worked through all those details yet. So with that, I thank Mrs. Manning for bringing this forward, but I cannot support that. Ms. Manning. Yeah, so I just wanted to make a comment on that. Um, the policies as presented to us this evening would not conflict with what is in this resolution and the model policies, so um, th there's, there's no issue there. Ms. Sanderson. The resolution as it's written currently ties our hands. Um, we can't deviate in any word or shape or any, any way. Um, I would propose an amendment to this policy and propose that we go with the resolution that was proposed to us from Ms. Franklin earlier this afternoon in place of this policy. And we all have it in our, our papers. This is a substitute motion. This is a substitute motion. Is there a second? Do I have a second? Second, uh, the motion is made by Ms. Anderson to uh, amend the resolution to uh, accept Jennifer Franklin's in place of Ms. Manning's. And I have a second by Mrs. Melnick. Uh, is there any discussion, Ms. Manning? Uh, first, Ms. Ms. Franklin and then Ms. Manning. Chair, sure. I'm sorry, because that wasn't part of the package, I'm not sure if it's made but you might need to read this, Mrs. Franklin, or point out the, the resolution so you understand what the current and what proposal is. Okay, so do we have Ms. Franklin read it? And then we'll have a discussion, okay? Ms. Franklin? Thank you. Um, actually, the first four paragraphs are exactly the same as Ms. Manning's resolution. Um, whereas so can you read them? I'm sorry. Just read the whole yes. thing. Mm -hmm. Read it. Yep. Just go ahead and read it. Whereas policy 5-7 of the school board of the city of Virginia Beach here and after school board directs a superintendent or designate to, to develop regulations, practices, and trainings related to compliance with Code of Virginia 22.1-23.3 as amended, whereas on September 18th, 2021, the superintendent of the City of Virginia Beach Public Schools here and after VBCPS adopted regulation 5-7.1 in compliance with 22.1-23.3 and the 2021 model policies for the treatment of transgender students in Virginia's public schools. Whereas on July 18th, 2023, the Virginia Department of Education, here and after VDOE, released the model policies on ensuring privacy, dignity, and respect for all students and parents in Virginia's public schools, here and after 2023 model policies that align with statutory provisions of Code of Virginia 20 due 22.1-23.3 as amended, whereas with the adoption of the 20, 2023 model policies, the VDOE has withdrawn the 2021 model policies, which have no further force and effect. And now therefore be it resolved, this is the new portion, 
resolved, the school board directs the superintendent or designee to modify current regulations to be consistent with, but may be more comprehensive than the 2023 model policies. The superintendent is directed to develop regulations regarding nicknames for all students. Further resolved that this resolution, resolution will clarify the intent to adopt policies consistent with Code of Virginia 22.1-23.3 as amended. Further resolved that this resolution will provide clarity to any other past resolutions adopted by the school board pertaining to this matter. Further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes, um, excuse me, of this board. <coughs> excuse me. Right. Okay. So she has read it. Now, is there any discussion on this motion? Yes, Ms. Manning. So I feel the language um, change is because, and, and this is my feeling on conversations I've had, um, that the purpose of this language change is because there's a plan to say that the model policies were passed and to let the public think that, and then make changes in future meetings or behind the scenes after the public believes that this issue has been resolved. Um, the nickname line is very vague and not transparent on what it means. However, I have had very detailed conversations with Ms. Franklin, the patron of this substitute resolution. And she has said that she mostly supports the model policies, but her sticking point is that there are times that she believes teachers should be able to keep gender identity name change secrets from parents. To me, that goes against the spirit and purpose of a majority of these policies and what the policies state that protects the rights of parents. And I think it is important to be honest with the public about the intentions of this substitute resolution. I also don't think it's fair to the superintendent because the language is vague. What does it really mean to develop re regulations regarding nicknames? Um, and I think because of you know, I think it's important that we keep the, the language that I had in the beginning without modification because I feel the superintendent is going to be pulled in many different directions by this very divisive board. And I think it's very important to give him clear direction on what we expect him to adopt in these um, regulations. And that's why I cannot support this. Ms. Ms. Owens. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'll start with uh, where I have agreement with Ms. Manning. Uh, in the uh, statement about the superintendent being directed to develop regulations uh, regarding nicknames, I don't feel it's fair to put that on the superintendent either. We know it is a, a topic of controversy, and I don't think it lies on the superintendent. It lies on the board to make that decision and take whatever good or bad comes from that. Uh, so that piece is uh, something that I wouldn't be in uh, favor of. In general, I, I'm not going to support a resolution that is going to place the board in violation of the Virginia Human Rights Act. My uh, belief on it is if changes are going to be put forth from VDOE or wherever, they need to start with making sure that it's not going to be in conflict with what's already there. And if they don't like the law that's already there, then there are procedures that you go through to change the Virginia Human Rights Act, and then you can follow that with information that directs school boards or VDOE information that people elected their uh, representatives and those representatives came up with bipartisan support for the Virginia Human Rights Act. And if that needs to be changed, that that's where that should start. Um, my other, well, I'll save my other thought uh, for when we discuss the other resolution, but uh, I'm not going to be able to support this one. You're not going to be able to support Ms. Um, Ms. Franklin's. Franklin's. Okay, thank you. Talking about the substitute. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you were, we were clear. Okay, Ms. Franklin. Thank you. And I, I am going to be a little bit long-winded here just because I feel like 
Um, there has been some comments made and I just wanna clarify where the intent was. Um, I just wanna make sure that when we're talking about this, um, just like we were able to be, you know, put in the 2021 model policies for our division that were modified for our division, I really would like to find a way for us to implement the 2023 model policies. I think it is important um, that we look at all all aspects of trying to be in compliance. Um, and I really took into account, you know, the comments that were made by the, the speakers tonight, and I appreciate them coming forward. Um, one thing that, I didn't just throw this together, I worked very closely with Ms. Linetti. Um, and I just wanna say that also, when I was talking to a very um, high-profiled attorney, and I spoke to him about some of my concerns that I have with um, the prior policy was with the bathrooms. Unfortunately, there is a state precedent, which is the reason why Governor Yunkin's policies refer to the state law. And so basically there is a state precedent, it's the legal precedent of the land of the state. And as much as I don't like it, we have to follow that state law until that changes. The appeal was not approved. Um, and so unless something happens, whether I like it or not, whether this board likes it or not, there is a state precedent already in place. And I want to make sure the public is understanding of that because no matter if we pass this resolution for Ms. Manning tonight, no matter what, we still have no control over part of what happens with bathrooms and locker rooms, okay? Because Grimm versus Gloucester County does tie our hands there. So what I wanted to do is, um, you know, I was talking to a state delegate and they said that this this uh, proposed policy, this proposed policy from Governor Yunkin's office, it does leave room specifically, intentionally for flexibility, that we are supposed to don this coat of, of uh, this proposed policy and craft it for our division. And this is coming from somebody who was there when it was all put together and that for us to say that this cannot be taken into account for our division, just like we did with the 2021 model policies, is inaccurate. I spoke to them. I spoke to people that actually were in Richmond at the time when this was all put together. And believe me, I am being my, my height, I can tell you, I understand modifying. I never buy something right off the rack. So I understand the importance of having something that is, is, is out there, that is for the public, but needs to be um, you know, have room for flexibility for each individual person and, and, and division. And another th reason I felt like it was important to bring this amended resolution is because we have over 66,000 students in the city of Virginia Beach. The way that the current policy is written is that there are two, th two names that can be, uh, that students can be called. Their legal name, and something that is akin to their legal name. And so whether this has anything to do with a transgender name or a different name, I believe that we have got to address for our division with 66 plus thousand students that there are going to be thousands of students that go by something other than their legal or a name that is akin to their legal name. Whether we we don't pass my amended re resolution or not, I believe that we have got to address that because again, I think that that is gonna put the, the superintendent in a position, because again, they, you know, admis administration, superintendent, they do put the regulations together to comply, okay? So one of the reasons that I wanted to address that and maybe it's not properly worded, and I apologize for that if that's not the case, but but we have to address what is going to happen with a nickname. And that's why I thought it was in here and I specifically put the verbiage directly from the model policy to, um, to be consistent with or maybe more comprehensive than the 2023 model policies. And for, in regards to the nicknames, it's for all students, not just a specific sect of students, which is actually one of the concerns that um, that Miss Linetti had. And you know, so 
for us to not address that, I think that that leaves us in a position that it's incredibly vague because we are going to have situations where we need to discuss what happens when somebody wants to be called another name, whether it has anything to do with their gender, sex, um, or not. And you know, from when I was talking to not only Ms. Linetti, but other um, aspects of people, you know, or leadership in this, in this division, basically we have a spot already that, that addresses nicknames. And I'm going to make one other comment, and then I'm going to ask Mr. Jameson to come up here and, and describe what we are doing in our policy right now. And, not, and, and I'm going to ask the board, if you don't agree that we're pretty much in the spirit of compliance with what we're doing currently. But I do want to just say one thing, because, you know, um, it's just really interesting when I see words on paper, how very different people can interpret those words. And, and intention, quite frankly, because I really, I really was trying to bring this board to a consensus on being able to come to a point where we are in the spirit of Governor Youngkin's policy, but also understood that in our large, large division, we are going to need to work with modifications that are also going to impact this very, very large division. And I would also like to just add that, you know, when I was going through a very difficult time in my life, there was a teacher that really put their arms around my daughter. And I'm so grateful for that teacher, and they know who they are. Um, I'm not going to call out their name because, unfortunately, in this environment right now, that is probably fodder for putting them in a position that's not appropriate. But I just want to say that when we bring our children to the school, we're not putting them on loan to the division. I get that. But we also have a situation where we're also bringing the kids, whatever is going on in the household, and teachers are the ones that have to work through and try to find a path to educating all students, which is what we ask them to do. And so, how do you create a culture of belonging, make parents feel like they're being heard? It, it is a question that I've been asking myself since we started this conversation, because I do not want to create a precedent that we are lying to parents. If I could figure out how we could do that, make sure that kids can also learn where they are, because we, again, I can be, I'm gonna be perfectly honest, when I was going through this very difficult time, I am sure that there were situations where my daughter was coming to school with some of the angst that, that was happening at home. And so, thankfully, she found a teacher advocate that was kind to her. They were kind to my daughter, and I'm incredibly grateful for that kindness. And so if there is a way for us to empower teachers to be able to find students where they are, help them to be educated, which is what we ask them to do, and also not create a precedent for making parents feel like they're not being seen, heard, or being lied to, I would love, maybe I'm just not smart enough to figure that out, but I would love, love, love to find a way for us to work through that as a division. So teachers can do their job, parents can feel, you know, like there is some trust put back in, in their lack of trust that they have right now. So, Mr. Jameson, if you wouldn't mind coming up. Can I interrupt just for a second? Um, Ms. Martin is online now. She has joined, she, and she told me she would try to get on. Okay. So she really does need to, because she would, came on after you read it. Oh. So she's going to be, need to hear the difference between Okay, Mrs. can I just Manning read the differences then? You can, you can finish with that, but she's going to need to hear that. Okay, well, if we can just, do you want me to do that before we have Mr. Jameson speak? You can, yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'll read that after Mr. Jamison speaks. And keep in mind, this is what we are currently doing. Well, good evening. <clears throat> uh, so when it comes to the, any incident in regards to nicknames, our school division, uh, school staff, when we receive a request in writing, we have an opportunity to then update what is called the nickname field within Synergy. At the time that that request comes in from a parent, 
We explain to them where it will live. It does not replace the legal name for the student. There's literally a separate field in the student tab within our student information system. It takes two to three days for that name to then populate over to other web-based apps such as Canvas or anything else that is accessible through ClassLink, and then it becomes visible to the student's peers when they are in any kind of discussion group or in some discussion or in a, excuse me, in Canvas and interacting with their peers. So the legal name no longer appears. It is not replaced, I wanna clarify that, but it is visible to peers and students. There are times when students will make a similar request. When a student makes that request, we then inform them this will be visible to other stakeholders, including your parents. And at that point in time, they then have a decision to make. If the decision is made to move forward with the nickname, it will then be visible to all. At the beginning of every school year, we send home STU 201, which is a report from Synergy that is our student data profile. Every parent or guardian is given an opportunity to review that for accuracy, whether it's address, phone number, email address, and on that document, it does include the nickname field. So if there was objection to that information, student or family member, parent or guardian, eligible student included, would have the opportunity to say, this is wrong, school, and this needs to be corrected to reflect fill in the blank name. Those types of changes can be made directly on that report and sent back to school with signature, or it can be given to us in writing via email. Thank you, Dr. Jameson. And so I, I, I just want to make sure that we are aware that even after the 20, 2021 model policies, we were able to craft this for our division that seems to work. I think that, Ms. Owens, I appreciate your concerns, but I feel like we already have something that really is in the spirit right now and also um, would not be too far off from trying to have our current leadership team be able to be guided where to go with this resolution. And again, keep in mind that who, who, when we say fully informed, so who's determining who's, what that means? Is it a reasonable Democrat? Is it a reasonable Republican? Is it a reasonable centrist? Is it a reasonable student? I mean, I, I think that we have to decide, you know, with that, if, if you're saying that my resolution is too vague, well then I, I quite frankly, with the fact that this model policy was left open for room for flexibility for each division, I, I, I think that we have to, we have to provide um, either very specific direction, which I don't think that any re resolution does, because again, even if we adopt Ms. Manning's resolution, there is still going to be a lot of vagueness um, in, in regards to how we move forward with that one as well. So that's what I have to say for now, thank you. Can you explain one more time the difference between yours and Mrs. Oh, I'm so sorry, Please. yes. Uh, that, that's what Mrs. Um, Ms. Ms. Martin, I did email to you a copy of the amendment if you've had a chance to okay. look at it, so she needs to see it. Ms. Martin. I just have a question. I'll get in the queue if that's okay. Okay, all right, Madam so Chair, Ms. Martin's in the queue, now Ms. Melnick. Madam Chair, point of order, I believe um, our bylaws state that when someone um, Zooms uh, in virtual, um, they have to state where, where they're participating from and all of that, correct, Ms. Lanetti? Yeah, she, she, I, I it has I, to be stated. No, I think she know. does now. I think at the time you said she was somewhere, but I think she just needs to, because it's a personal reason, she needs to verify from where she's participating. Okay, so can you verify where you are, Mrs. Martin? Yes, I am in Savannah, Georgia at the U.S. Travel ESTO Conference. Where are you at this point? I'm, I'm at the West End in my hotel room. There's no one around me. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Ms. Melnick. So, Mr. Jameson, I'm, you don't have to come back up, but I, I want to say that Virginia Beach City, Pool, City Public Schools is envied for a reason. And we are surrounded by incredible leaders that it's actually astounding when you, 
what Mr. Jamison just said, what he explained, which has already been in practice, um, which was echoed by Dr. Robertson, that we are really compliant with the model policies and that we had just a few minor tweaks, which was confirmed by Ms. Franklin in meeting with a state delegate, which then makes me question why we even need a resolution to pass this to begin with. So we're going to round robin this. We're going to round robin. It's 944. And we're going to talk about these resolutions. And we don't need a resolution to move forward. We don't. And we will talk about this at nauseum. And the minutes are going to click, tick. And we, we do not need a resolution to move forward. We have phenomenal leaders, and I've said from the beginning, nobody's intention on this dais is to say no to the governor. But it is our intention in a division of this size to tweak a few things while remaining in compliance, but to set it in a way that we are meeting the needs of all of our students in the right way without saying no to the governor. And we, we had that ability. There are divisions in the state of Virginia that just flat out said, no, we're not talking about this, we're not changing anything, and we did. And we have a policy review committee that spent six hours on this very subject and brought forth some really fair stuff. We have Mr. Jameson that stood up again and, and outlined our, our procedures we're pretty darn good. And so with that, I I'm hoping that we can move forward without either one of these resolutions. OK, Ms. Martin. Oh, sorry, Ms. Weems, and then Ms. Martin, she moved her Yes, I, I think that the reason why some have brought forth resolutions is because in previous years, policies from the governor were enacted without talk at all. They were just enacted because that's the law with, with minimum talk. And this was brought forth weeks and weeks and weeks ago, and we, we haven't enacted. So I think that's the reason for these two um, colleagues bringing up resolutions. Um, I'm not going to be able to support the support mo um, substitute motion. We just heard that no matter if you're transgender, if you're not, if you're, no matter who you are, if you want a nickname, there is a way to do it. My son is William Thomas. He's been called Beamer. It has nothing to do with his name. I filled out the forms. We didn't have the same type that we have now, but I filled out forms. I filled out legal forms. <laughs> Nobody was keeping a secret. With trying to vote on something that gives the superintendent, he's going to do some sort of regulation with the nicknames that I don't know what regulation he's going to do. I don't know if it's going to open the door. What is a nickname? I don't want teachers or counselors to decide what is a nickname. I talked to the same legislator that had con concerns about nickname and what is a nickname? Is Nick a nickname Jack? Is a nickname Laser Tag? Is a nickname Beamer? And so I just don't want to put people in that vague um, position to then decide what a nickname is because it will be different for everybody. So I will not be able to support this. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I comment? I do think the school administration needs some guidance here because in the example Mrs. Weems is giving, if you adopt the 2023 policy, your problem with names, it has to be natural, a derivative of the name. So in Mrs. Weems' case, where she's talking about her child named Beamer, you know, if that is not a natural derivative of the main name, that may be a problem. That's, that's part of the issue with that particular language on there. What we were talking about through the school administration was and this just, we just need guidance as to where you want to go with this. The process that the school division has is the nickname goes into the field, and whoever is a legal right, that could be an eligible or an adult student for the audience, can put that information, as Mr. Jameson explained, or the legal guardian or parent for the child can put it in, and that becomes the nickname we use. We were trying to clarify that language. That's how we look at what your nickname is going to be. So in what we want to be able to say is, if you're a parent, and I let's say your name is William, but you just call the kid Junior, and just uh, that's not a natural derivative of, of William. It doesn't actually come fine, but it's okay with the family. Nobody has a problem with that. If you were to put that in the nickname field on our d databases, 
we would accept that, but the 2023 policy isn't clear that that's it. So we need some clarification there. If nobody's objecting to you calling the kid a nickname that you had, you know, everybody calls the kid Jay, but his real name is James, and that's not, Jay is not necessarily a derivative of James, that's okay. We're not going to have a problem with that. But the, if the 2020 got, 2023 model guidelines don't necessarily let you do that. So we need some clarification on that. And that's what we were trying to get to. So I had suggested some changes, the school administration some changes. We're not talking about a student making up a name on that because we've never allowed that particular area. We need some clarification on what you want us to do in these circumstances. And that could be, and I did have this discussion with some of the school board members, that could be viewed as a clarification or being a little bit more comprehensive, explaining it. And I think that was my conversation, a lot of my conversation with Mrs. Franklin was, what do you do in those situations where the families agree that there is a name for this student, but it doesn't fall under the model policies? How do we, how can we write that? Is that, is that what the superintendent's allowed to write into a regulation? How do we deal with that circumstance? Because there's certainly situations where the family name isn't naturally the legal name of the kid, and that's a legitimate family name. Nobody's objecting to that. We need clarification on that. Okay, Ms. Martin. Hi, um, good evening, Madam Chair. Um, I've read over the, the original motion, of course, and the substitute motion, and I'm concerned that these lack specificity. Um, I, I, I come from an international background. I'm a first generation American, and Ms. Linetti is talking about sort of commonly accepted nicknames, but the fact is we have an international community we don't have any training in American naming conventions, let alone international naming conventions. We have many students who have, uh, have names in, in foreign languages, in Cyrillic and Mandarin, who choose nicknames that are anglicized that may not be related to their actual birth certificate name. We need to fully define some naming conventions both American and international. I'm gravely concerned, not so much on the naming piece and not so much on the parental notification piece, although I have indicated to my colleagues, I would prefer to see an age cut off where students 14 and up have some semblance of sovereignty in terms of how they're treated in school. But I'm gravely concerned, as I spoke at the last meeting about this definition of what does fully informed mean? Does this mean that we have a student whose parents want them to wear a, a religious head covering? The student doesn't want to. And this parent wants daily reports on whether or not the student is following their parents' guidance on that. Is that fully informed? Is fully informed emailing the parent and letting them know who their prom date is? Is it letting them know who they're sitting with at lunch? We need to know that because if we adopt this policy and that is undefined and we don't share information like that, we're facing potential litigation. The second piece of this is even more of a grave concern to me and that's section three where Governor Youngkin's policy indicates that we will strive to meet distinctive needs and unique needs. This does not reference ADA or 504. So what exactly does that mean? And so I think that what I would like to see is have us hit the pause button, have Ms. Linetti, Dr. Robinson, the PRC, define some of those vague terms that are in Governor Youngkin's policy. I wanna get this right. And like Ms. Melnick said, we want to adopt this policy. We understand our obligations to the Virginia Department of Education. At the same time, it's obvious that the governor is allowing some wiggle room in there by offering up these relatively vague definitions so that school systems can define those things based on their needs. Um, so I'm deeply involved in implementing policy for this administration and others. And I think we need some time to get this right, define our naming conventions, American and international, define fully informed, define distinctive needs, and define unique needs. I want us to get this right. 
going forward. I absolutely would want to meet the, our obligations to the VDOE and to our parents, but we have to get it right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Um, Ms. Franklin. And I just want to also just add this. You know, when we were discussing, um, even when I, I was in discussion with Ms. Manning, her concern was the spirit of Governor Youngkin's policies. And I feel like we maintain the spirit of his policy while also addressing something that is definitely needed to be addressed in regards to the nicknames. And again, because Ms. Linetti had said that we have got to discuss what we're gonna do because right now we have a field that can be filled out with, and we already have an opportunity for parents to be involved in this. And if we are not putting ourselves in a position where we are addressing the nicknames and only going by two, and we have the school year starting, oh my gosh, that is going to be crazy when not only are we starting a week early, but now all of a sudden kids can no longer be called, you know, the name that the nickname they've been using for however long. So, so that's why I feel like we have to address the nickname situation. And I did, again, say that we are developing regulations, which we already have, by the way, um, regarding nicknames for all students, all students. Thank you. Ms. Manning. Yeah, I just, um, it's been referenced several times in these meetings and uh, Ms. Martin just referenced it and it's referencing f um, fully informed, but nowhere in the model policies that I can find in the actual model policies themselves does it say those words anywhere. So I, I just wanted to point that out. Ms. Anderson. So, so um, even in the model policies, there's, there's, a, there's, as was pointed out, there's, there's wiggle room. So even the, in the governor's policies, he recognizes that there are times, for example, if a student indicates that you know, they might commit suicide if their parents find out about this. Um, there's room at that point, that's when we would use other resources. And wouldn't call the parent, might not call the parent right away, but pull in other resources. Um, and so because of that, because obviously the governor realized, in, in the governor's policies, they realize that you know, there has to be a little bit of wiggle room here. But the other thing is, is maybe the student might not commit suicide, but, you know, they, they could experience verbal yeah. language that, you know, makes them feel horrible, makes them feel worse. Um, I, I think we need to come up with a policy with this nickname thing that, that is going to protect the students in some way. Um, I just, that's where I have a problem with the fact that Ms. Manning's resolution was too strict. I understand, and that's why I suggested that we go with one that was a little less stringent, less, less strict. Um, we, we already, we know that we're going to try to adopt these policies that the governor has come down with, but there are, I just feel like there are some, there is some wiggle room that we need to be able to do, and we need to not say, oh, we're gonna adopt these policies verbatim. I mean, and, and that's basically why I feel like we need something with a little more, not as stringent. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of this resolution, this substitute resolution, because it's not as stringent and um, gives us a little bit of leeway when it comes, especially to the nicknames. Um, so, you know, I just, I'm, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna support this and hopefully uh, we can vote on this and support this instead of the, the one that doesn't allow us to have any wiggle room at all. Okay, uh, Mr. Callum. Go ahead. 
we didn't see it. Sorry. It's taken us a long time to get here. We can continue to proverbially kick the can down the road even further, <laughs> looking for something that resembles perfection. But I think the spirit that surrounds the reason for these policies is due to the fact that culturally we've gotten to a place that alarmed a great number of parents. And that place was a state representative could be informed of information about a child and could, with intentionality, withhold that information from a parent. We can go round and round on lots of other things that surround this issue, but that is the sacred ground on which this whole matter turns. We can make reference to the concerns that surround nicknames, but reading from the document itself from the Department of Education, it says as follows, that personnel shall refer to a student by a name other than one in the student's official record or by pronouns other than those appropriate to the sex appearing in the student's official record only if yes. an eligible student or a student's parent mm -hmm. has instructed in writing that such other name or pronoun be used. So if there is a preferred pronoun, there is, maybe Mrs. Anderson is using the right term, there's wiggle room to be able to receive that, accommodate that, build that into the system and move forward. Mm -hmm. But the sacred ground remains the same. You do not become aware of information that's crucial, serious and significant, and with intentionality, withhold that from a parent. As a result of that, whatever resolution we happen to be in the midst of or whatever motion we happen to be in the midst of, one of the issues that does also accompany this process is the fact that it is law that when a model policy comes out, as I understand the law, and I'm no attorney, but it is a requirement that the school system adhere to and embrace those policies. Failure to do so leads you to problems that you don't want to contemplate. So, that's a long-winded way of saying that I'm in favor of these model policies going forward, and whenever it's time to vote, that's what my vote will be. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Martin. Um, yes, I wanted to um, point out where the words fully informed are in the model policy, if I may. And that is in section two, letter A, number three, in the section where it references Troxel versus Granville, which is not an education case, which is actually a case where a parent is denying uh, paternal grandparents visitation rights and the court affirms the right to parents to deny grandparents visitation rights. In that section, it reads, to ensure parents are able to make the best decisions with respect to their child, school personnel shall keep parents fully informed about all matters that may be reasonably expected to be important to a parent, including and without limitation matters related to their child's health and social and psychological development. It is in there and it needs to be defined. Thank you. Mr. Culpepper. Mr. Culpepper. Yeah, again, I hate playing tit for tat, but... Uh, sorry, we, neither one of us saw you. We're sorry. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I hate playing tit for tat, but uh, that's in the preamble. It is not in the policy that is reflected in the resolution that is before us. The, uh, what Ms. Martin was just discussing. In any case, um, this discussion actually really proves 
to me, Ms. Manning's original point, which is we need to be quite specific here. Um, I, very, I, I do very much actually uh, appreciate what is in the substitute, because the substitute more or less says institute the model policies, which is the intent here in the long run. But again, as this discussion shows, without some specific guidance, we can go around and around and around all day long about what that means. What well, we owe the administration tonight, tonight, not tomorrow, not two weeks from now, and certainly not a month from now, what well, we owe the administration tonight is clear direction about what they must do moving forward to prepare for school, which starts in a week. So again, while I, while I appreciate what the substitute motion has in it, what it lacks is why I can't support it. Uh, Ms. Anderson, you made, a, you made a good point here earlier, and there may be some other discussion if we move on to, to going back to the original motion, and I'll wait for that. Okay, Ms. Melnick, and then Ms. Brown. Mrs. Linetti, if nobody had brought forth a resolution, how would we be voting on this? That's going to be a difficult question. What I would say to you is you brought PRC said we were going to look at certain policies and then we were really looking for guidance. Our problem really became is the resolution that you passed in June. We needed to understand what it was you wanted the administration to do because it specifically says the school board's not going to violate the laws and the superintendent's not to amend anything. So we need a clarification where you want the school administration to go on amending these policies and regulations. What do you mean by compliance on these issues? So they, the superintendent's office has been waiting for some direction because they don't want to violate your June resolution. So clarify for them what they want them to do. That's the problem. Without that resolution, we would be looking at our policies and regulations to determine it. Different than what Mrs. Manny is saying is, let's have one policy here. When the North Administration put out its policy, we didn't do one policy. We put, we put the different aspects in different policies and regulations as they made sense to how we run the organization. So we would have been looking to see where we were. And this is sort of what we were trying to explain at PRC. If you want to look at, at facilities, we created regulation 544.2. If you want to look at dress code, which is required, we had amended that as 544.1, where we have dress code on there. Um, we have student records issues. We have confidentiality issues that are already in there. We took 5, 7.1 and created regulation to try to gather those things that didn't fit naturally in there. So we were probably looking at 5, 7.1. And when we talked with this at the PRC, we didn't feel like we were that off. The way we wrote 5, 7.1 was just a different way of sort of explaining the, the, the what I would call the identification pieces in here. I will say, there's, you can read it this way, or you, I had suggested some language, the superintendent suggested some language. We're trying to clarify for them. It's a philosophy in how you're going to do this. You can say, adopt the 2023 model policy as Mrs. Manning has put out there, and it's all in one place. Or do we keep where we put them in our different parts of our policies and regulation where it makes sense for us to do that? And isn't that what we did with Governor Northam's policies? We did not. We did not adopt those in, in totality. We No, and we actually, some of the stuff, particularly if you read 5, 7.1, we didn't exactly agree with what the North Administration said, so we kind of worked what we were willing to work with at that point. But we didn't put it all in one policy, because it doesn't make sense for us to look for it there. Isn't that what I said 20 minutes ago, 25, 30 minutes ago, that we don't need a resolution to vote on this, that we should be voting on the different policies? And, and I'll be honest, in both of these, we're directing the superintendent to do things. I've been sitting on this board with some members of, the, of this board who say, we direct the superintendent to do nothing because the superintendent works for us. So it's, it's just confusing in so many ways that we'd be directing when we don't want, I, I don't understand why we're not doing this exactly with the way we did the 2021 model policies, which is to, to pull it out and to do it the way it works for our division. I, I'm, I'm, this is very perplexing to me. And I'd like to remind the public that pretty soon we're going to have an, a new governor because as everybody knows, 
the governor of Virginia cannot run for re-election. So guess what, friends? We're going to be back here again, depending on who our next governor is. Okay. And so stay I'm on, asking stay on that topic, we please. literally just pull, let's do it the way we did before. We have some great things in place. It, it meets the standards for the governor's model policies, and it satisfies the needs of the division. I, I do not believe that we need a resolution to vote on, on these, regu these policies and these regulations, and okay. we should have some ability to see what they bring forward and whether or not we agree that it, that it goes forward. So I, I'm voting no on both of these resolutions. Okay, thank you. Ms. Brown. Okay, thank you. Um, so as we've discussed, this is the Code of Virginia. Um, and, um, you know, I think maybe we can all maybe agree uh, that 22.1-23.3 was a bad law to start with, but here we are. That is the law. Um, and so we are going to follow the law, um, and, and that's what we need to do. Um, my concerns with this substitute are very similar to the concerns I had with the prior resolution, um, and that's the fact that there isn't clarity here. When we vote on resolutions, what is in the resolution is what we are supporting, and I'm not willing to say I'm going to direct to develop regulations regarding nicknames for all students, especially since I know that a number of my colleagues are talking about um, nicknames, meaning a name that doesn't match your gender and not telling your parent. And nicknames are names everybody knows. They aren't names that your teacher knows and then they have to do something different when they're in front of your parent um, or the whole classroom has to use a different name because the parents are coming. And that's, that's what we're doing right now. Um, Gavin Grimm's case was brought up, Grimm versus Glosser. It, it is my belief personally that that is a very narrow case. Um, Grimm was in high school, his parents were aware, uh, there was a diagnosis. There was a formal letter from a licensed professional. There was injections, reassignment surgery, persistent belief. Uh, the license was changed through the courts. The birth certificate was changed through the courts. Um, the court only addressed the bathrooms. There was no student complaints. Um, and so um, in, in this, there was no violation of safety and the school had retrofitted the bathrooms. So I, I, um, I don't 100% agree with the assessment, but I do I understand that we are tied a little bit by the Graham versus Gloucester case. Um, and then another thing that I hear coming up a lot is the Virginia Human Rights Act. And um, the code was very specifically mentioned um, by several speakers was 3904. Um, which is non-discrimination in places of public accommodation. Um, it actually specifically says that that is for individuals over the age of 18 within that very section of code. So I, I don't know that we can use the Virginia Human Rights Act to hide from implementing the governor's model policies. Um, so I do not support the substitute and um, Hopefully we can vote and move on. Thank you. Mr. Culpepper. All right, I, I might be belaboring the point a little bit, but it's, I think it's worth it. Um, I need to ask the superintendent this question. If we don't pass anything tonight, if we pass, pass neither the substitute nor the uh, original resolution, what happens? What, 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 will, what will the administration do? Uh, you want to answer that, um, Dr. Robertson? I think they are ready, but go ahead and answer with what you've told me. So without direction from the board, I can't take any action. So without direction from the board, the current policies we've been operating under since 2021 will be the op policies we operate under when school starts next week. Mm. Without direction from the board, there's nothing that I can do because I don't hold any authority. Can we do it without 
out a resolution? Okay. okay. I'm going to go back to, I think your problem becomes the resolution that you passed. I think it was technically passed on June 13th, but proposed on June 12th. Um, what did you mean by that? Because you specifically told the superintendent, don't amend anything if you believe it's a violation. So you need to help him, uh, that student association, understand, is he allowed to amend regulations or isn't he? Because what is your interpretation? What, what did you mean by your resolution when you passed it? Help him understand where he needs to go so that he's not in violation of that resolution, because that is an act that you took. It's a resolution. It is an act of the board. A resolution is simply a formal motion put in writing that you voted on. So make sure he's not in violation to do that. You can make your own decision about what, whether you pass policies or not, but he was that directed the superintendent not to amend any regulations. So help him understand what you want him to do so that he can make appropriate regulations. Because without that resolution, he could have made some decisions about whether you want to come in compliance or amending some of this on there, but with that, with that particular resolution, I think it puts him at jeopardy or the school administration at jeopardy of violating what you wanted them to do. So you need to clarify that for him. Okay, so let me let me ask you this as the chair, okay? You and Mr. Jamison have been working on the regulations to go along with the, the policies, right? Am I correct? So if we give you the go ahead to use those, because you base them on the model policy. Correct. If we give you the go-ahead to, to implement them and use them, then you will be able to move forward with the, under the new model policy. Am I correct? Did you, did you not send those to all of us? Yes, and so what I, what, let me just add a little bit of information there. Um, we clearly understand um, the uh, how this policy will impact people. Uh, some will be very anxious about it. We also understand you guys are going to, you 11 are going to have to answer to the implementation of this policy. So it's not normal that we share regulations with you while they're being developed. You entrust us through policy to take policies and operationalize them through regulations and then we share with you the regulations after they've been approved and are being enacted. I didn't take that approach here because I wanted you to be well aware of what we were thinking about in terms of implementing the model policies because I will tell you I want to thank you guys for the conversations we've had individually one-on-one -on -one, because every one of you have been clear in your conversations and that is we need to implement the new model policies. And then several of you expressed concerns about specific areas of the model policies related to worrying about teachers, worrying about um, students and how they may react and all the various things. And it just represented a lot of thoughtfulness on your part. And you guys have done your homework. Um, you have dove into the model policies and, and, and availed yourself of a lot of information, and that's really good. So it's important for the public to know that none of you are shirking your responsibility. All of you want to do this, and you want to get it right. What I simply need is direction. So I do appreciate the fact that, um, you know, Ms. Manning mentioned uh, one resolution is kind of crystal clear. We're going to do it in 571, and this is what it's going to be. There's... From, from an E standpoint, it's much easier for us to look at that language and say, okay, here you go. To work with Ms. Franklin and address some of the concerns that she had around trying to be consistent with the model policies, I really feel like you, you guys need to have a little more information so that this board can be comfortable with what they're voting on. You mentioned the whole nickname piece is one piece, so, you know, but to do that, you, you need to recognize it's unlikely to get fleshed out tonight. Mm -hmm. And so if it's unlikely to get fleshed out tonight, you'd have to be comfortable with having this conversation again September 12th. So, you know, the, the team stands prepared to take action based upon what this board decides tonight. Okay. We have three more people. Ms. Anderson. 
Okay. So I've listened to what everybody had to say, and, and, and I, I just want to say this to the public. We're not trying to keep secrets from parents. I just want to make that clear. Um, and we want to be able to enact policies that are what's best for our students. But in looking at all of this and realizing that, yes, this substitute motion is vague, but the other resolution is it ties our hands and we're stuck with everything that it says. And there are just a few things in there that are not, not right for our division. And so therefore, um, I just think, I think we need to take this a little slower and we need to, we need to, we need to develop policies through the PRC and then if it's not ready by the time school starts, well, okay, it's not. We can develop these policies and regulations down the road. I don't, I don't like the fact that, we're, that I feel rushed in all of this. We could, have, we could have tackled this a long time ago, but we weren't able to because first of all, PRC wasn't even, wasn't even together until just a couple, about a couple weeks ago. We were a month late in developing our PRC group. Um, so, you know, it just, it needs to be done through, pol through policy and through PRC, and we need to take it slow and do it right. And I think Ms. Martin talked about defining vague terms in the governor's policies and, we, and, and utilizing, you know, those coming, coming to terms with what some of those things mean. We need to define that on our own here. Um, and so, you know, like I said, that e neither one of these are really ideal, and so I guess I'm just gonna end up probably voting against both of them anyway. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Franklin. Okay, just one last comment. Um, I, think, I think the comments about the Grimm versus Gloucester County are just perfect. Um, is a perfect example of how people can look at a situation which I can tell you every single attorney that I've spoken to say that it creates a legal precedent in Virginia, whether we like it or not, and, and still have alternate opinions about um, the, the legality or, or the credibility of it. Um, and part of me, and I'm not I promise I'm not trying to be snarky um, on, when I say this, but if we were so concerned about making sure that our leadership team was prepared for this upcoming school year, then we would not have put them in a position where we didn't have a communications director right now. And then lastly, I wanna just ask a question. Um, if we pass the resolution, Cami, Ms. Linetti, can we go back and address this nickname situation? Or is this, or is this completely off the table at that point? The, table. the conversation we've had with some of you has been that you can be more comprehensive, so more comprehensive could define out the nickname, so you would have to decide how comfortable you are with that. Um, so that, I just think, it really is a question of how strict you're willing to be. Are you going to allow a, res a regulation or another policy that explains it? And how, I think we've explained to you what our procedures, the school division's procedures are, which is the nickname is what you put in the legal document in that nickname field. And that's what we're going to follow. Um, and we would, I think we would explain a little bit clearer than the model policy is that's what you're going to follow, what is put into the official documents, and that's what we're going to follow, but we're not going for nicknames. Um, I think we had suggested those common names that you might have, like, hey, quarterback, hey, captain, something like that, maybe because you're the captain of the football team. We don't consider those changes on there. We were trying to clarify for that because we're trying to get ahead of where the administration's going to be. I think you might be able to define that, but I'm not 100% sure how comfortable all of you are with that. That's how strict do you want us to be because we are not going to have a lot of flexibility and you're gonna have somebody, I'm not so much worried about, 
if we follow model guidelines, we understand what the student wants a different name from the family. And if the student doesn't have the legal rights to do that, our procedures don't allow the student to put in a different name. It's going to be that situation where there is a name that isn't commonly associated with that name. Are we okay with that? And can we put that in there? I think that your model guidelines try to do it. I think the way we were trying to write it was just a little bit clearer for us. The, so you, again, I'm down to our, what are we going to do in that one situation where it's not clear? Are you going to let a little bit more guidelines here? Do you want to put that in a policy? That's where the school administration is going to be stuck because somebody's going to bring forward an issue, help them understand exactly what you want them to do. And that's, and that's thank you, because I mean, again, if we put it into place, and uh, believe me, I, I actually agree with a, a large chunk of all this, but I just feel like we, if we do it without modification, then we have no ability after that to go back because that's how our votes work. If we pass this, then without modification, then the verbiage where it talks about the name used only refers to the legal name or the name that is akin to that. And it really puts us in a position. And so, so I just wanna, I wanna find out with clarity if we would pass the policy, because I do, I, I would love for to give our leadership team guidance on this, but if we pass the policy, are we, where are we in a position where we are going to discuss how a variation can happen? And I, that's, I guess. It's in there, how to happen. I think you can, <laughs> excuse me, you can do a policy clarifying that you agree. I think the, sup the superintendent school administration can be trapped if you don't give them some guidance. You can always do your own policy to clarify if you want to do that. That's something you can make that decision. I think that the school administration is going to be trapped if you're not clear with them what they can do in implementing this. What are you trying to find? <laughs> okay. All right. So let's vote on the amendment, okay? Are we good? Can you just clarify what we're voting on? We're voting okay. on... Ms. We are voting on Ms. Franklin's substitute resolution, and it's up on the board, okay? All right. All in favor of Ms. Franklin's substitute motion, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Ms. Martin, how do you vote? No. One more time, yes or no? No. No. Thank you. <laughs> All that are against Ms. Franklin's substitute motion for substitute resolution, please raise your hand. So Madam Chair, we have one aye and 10 nays, so the substitute motion did not pass. Okay. Now we're going to go back to the original resolution, which is Ms. Manny's res resolution. And Ms. Williams wants to speak first, <laughs> and then Ms. Manning can speak. <laughs> I know, because I got, I got cut off last time. Um, okay, the superintendents across the state, I got this on the, D, on the website, um, got a memo recently, August 18th. As noted, blah, 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 the requirement, I'm not going to read it all, but that local school boards adopt policies consistent with, the, consistent with those issued by the department is codified in statute and therefore the law of the land. Like all other statutory mandates, the General Assembly requires school boards to obey. Local school boards must comply with this directive in order to be in compliance with state law. Local school boards that elect not to adopt policies consistent with those released by the department for the upcoming school year assume all legal responsibility for noncompliance. That's the middle paragraph there. We need to follow the law. Mr. Callan just read that in the model policy, it says there is a way to be called any name you want to be. I think that it boils down to, do we want parents in the loop? Do we want parents in the know when it comes to pronouns and nouns? I do. And there's a way for that. I think parents are parents. Parents need to be involved even in that. The reason why we, I'm 
supporting the recovery so much that we talked about is because the parental in peace. If you're suffering from substance abuse disorder, your parents need to know to help you. Um, again, I think it boils down to, if you want parents in the know for that decision, which I do, vote for this. If you don't, and it does, in Northern's policy, it does say teachers can keep secrets. It's, it's, in fact, so we have the whole form that says, do you want your parents to know? Is this our secret? We have examples in our schools in the last few months about teachers telling certain groups not to call a certain name and yes to call and when because we're keeping secret from parents. If you want that to continue to happen, don't for, vote for this. If you want parents to be in the loop, in the know, parenting their child, vote for this resolution. And if you want to follow the law, let's vote for this resolution. Thank you. Mrs. Booms, I do want to point out, we never drafted policies or regulations to direct our staff not to provide that information. If you check what we have, we, that's not currently in any of our policies or regulations. That may have been what the Northam administration was recommending, but that's not what we ever drafted. Okay, thank you. Yes, it was a Northam's, Northam's thing. Thank you for clarifying that. But we have cases, which I brought to the board, where teachers have recently told other groups of students when they are to use what names, and I brought that to administration's attention. Thank you. Ms. Manning. So um, I want to discuss a couple of things in my resolution. First of all, my resolution directs the superintendent to adopt the model policies attached to the resolution. Not nowhere in this document does it say parents it, use the term fully informed. Um, it does not have it in, in here, so that shouldn't be an issue. Um, under identification of students, um, I guess the question that I have for you, Dr. Robertson, is it says VBCPS personnel shall refer to each student using only the name that appears in the student's official record. So basically where we have in, I believe it's parent view or on any forms that we have, it has nickname. If a parent puts that in there, is that con considered the name that appears in the student's official record? So if, if the parent is uh, so provided a nickname for the student, yeah. then the student's official name is still their name, but the nickname we can use. Right. So, so this, these model policies already provide the superintendent with an ability to allow parents to input the nickname field. I mean, he could send out a letter at the beginning of the year or, or throughout the year if you, you know, want your child to be called by a certain nickname. It, it allows for that in this document. So that should not be an issue. Um, and yes, we have been keeping secrets from parents. I have the document here that was distributed among school staff. I have it right here. It says, guiding questions to support students requesting a name or pronoun change. And it says, um, uh, if parents or guardians are not aware or affirming of the student's gender identity, describe how homeschool communication will be handled. And it says, as a school, we will do everything we can to affirm you by your, using your requested name and or pronouns. However, when we communicate with your parents or guardians, we will use the name and pronouns used by your parents or guardians. So it's keeping secrets from parents. This is a document that has been used in Virginia Beach. I don't know if it's currently being used, but it has been. And so, yes, we are keeping secrets from parents, and it just needs to end. Thank you. Mr. Culpepper. Thank you. I would just uh, caution us against uh, what in the Navy we would have called paralysis by analysis. We can, we can think of, um, we've already thought of a thousand things that, uh, you know, that we need to think about, we need to come up with an answer to. And we can think of 10,000 more, we can think of a million more. And then there will be things that came up that we never thought of. It's inevitable. But as a, as a big picture, these policies address the key issues um, that concern our constituents. You know, arguably, uh, the governor won the election on a turn of one phrase. Parents should not be involved in telling schools how to teach their kids. And quite obviously, you know, the, the electorate rejected that, that concept. Once we, you know, if we, if we adopt this as is, our hands aren't tied, and nothing says we can't come, come in behind these things and add policies that add detail in any place that we want to. There's nothing that says the administration can't put regulations 
subordinate to 57 or in addition to 57 to provide additional details on how we're going to implement these policies or practices, which may be what you're reading right there, or practices which are, you know, the call it the in the weeds details, I suppose, of how the administration enacts certain things. So nothing in here ties our hands, except to the extent that our hands are tied by what is in law, unless we're willing to step out and say we're not going to follow the law. Thank you. Ms. Martin. I find it ironic uh, that Mr. Culpepper just mentioned uh, not following the law because Northam's model policy came, came out in July of 2021. By September of 2022, only 10% of school districts had adopted those policies. 90% had not over a year later. We have time to sort this out. We have time to define things in a way that fit our school district. Augusta, Bedford, Pennsylvania, Russell, Warren, and Chesapeake never adopted Northam's model policies and there was no consequence because it isn't legislative code. It is a model policy. It was not passed by the General Assembly. The Dillon Rule is not in effect. So we have time to sort this out and it is my understanding that all 11 members of this board want to keep parents informed, but want to do so in a way that doesn't expose us to litigation, that doesn't expose our teachers to needless and time-consuming clerical work, and in a way that respects the sovereignty of our mature students while they are in our public school system. So we don't have to pass this tonight. We don't even have to pass this in two weeks. There are school districts that never pass Northam's policies. And there will be school districts that never pass Yonkin's policies. But what I'm understanding is that everyone in this board has a place to meet in the middle. And we need to get there through the PRC, and through interactions with the administration in terms of how regulations can be adopted to meet what the PRC passes and what this board passes. Thank you. Ms. Owens. Thank you. I wanna uh, kind of start out by acknowledging that there are many times where Ms. Manning and I fall on opposite ends of an issue. It's not surprising to people. <laughs> um, and I feel like we can do that in a way that still has a level of respect to it, where I still uh, can sit next to her and we still are able to be on committees and work well together. Um, I wanna start off with the things that I agree with Ms. Manning with uh, her resolution. I agree with, I don't know what, the second further resolved in her resolution um, that basically implies that school board approval by majority vote should be happening in terms of changes to regulation 57.1. And I know that that is outside of what is normal for our board and I generally don't like to micromanage uh, anything within the district, because that's really not the board's role. However, this policy and this, these regulations are clearly controversial, they're a hot topic, and it should be on the shoulder of the board members uh, to see how that implementation goes and not uh, at the direction of administration to be able to change without board members being aware or board members' approval. And so while I generally would be against uh, the idea of that level of micromanagement, uh, I would be in support of adding something into our policy that talks about those specific regulations needing board approval. Uh, I also think it's important that we are kind of honest with 
who we are as a board and as a district. Uh, and so when we talk about the Northern policies, and uh, Ms. Martin pointed out that they weren't uh, adopted by every district in the, the state, when we look at what our district did, they weren't adopted unanimously. We had a vote, and we can all sit on the board now and say we, we absolutely have to pass everything in totality because it's the law and it's the right thing to do, but we've been here at this moment before, and it wasn't passed unanimously, and it's because people stood on their principle of there are things in here that I agree with principle-wise, and there are things in here that I don't agree with principle-wise, and didn't make it about following this or following that or what's going to happen. They stood on their principle, and that's who they were, and I can respect that. In terms of where we are now, I am going to stand on my principle that the Virginia Human Rights Act is currently in the law and that I think our students have a right to be protected by that law and we passed a resolution that said that. And that is where I stand with it and so I, I wanted to make sure that there was clarity because I know when Mr. Robertson uh, or Dr. Robertson <laughs> spoke and said that we've all had the individual conversations with, with him and that we all want uh, to pass the, the new model policies, I think we all want to make sure that we are communicating with parents in a way that helps build trust. But I think it would be disingenuous to say that I, I said I want to pass these model policies in totality. And I'm okay with being honest and standing on my principle uh, that I don't agree with everything that's in here. The fact that there are questions about where there are going to be uh, conflicts with the Virginia Human Rights Act, that, that is an issue for me. Uh, furthermore, well, I, I won't belabor it. I would say that we have the ability as a board to get very specific about what we want to see. It's what we have uh, been able to, to build in the past. I will say that last time we were in this place, the board kind of didn't take on that full responsibility and perhaps should have, and we wouldn't be in this position now. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that we are at a crisis mode of what happens if we don't pass it today? We know what happens. We We'll follow the regulations until, that we have in place until we come to an agreement on what happens next. I feel like our staff members have come to us even today and said that they are overworked for the amount of time that they have, that they are trying to get their classrooms together, that they are trying to manage the overwhelming amount of tasks without enough time. They came to speak at our summer retreat for those who are able to, to be present at the summer retreat to hear their pleas, to please not put more things on their plate that they don't have time for without finding the time for that. Uh, I have concerns about how this uh, notifications are going to impact their time when we haven't been able to have discussions about what that implementation actually looks like. Uh, does it look like notifying them within 24 hours of hearing something? Does it look like having to contact every legal guardian on their list or only one? Does that suffice? Does it look like if you ask the child, is the parent already aware? Do you still have to make the call every time a new teacher learns of something? I would like to have that fleshed out before we make a decision that is going to impact our staff members' time. I'm also concerned about how this impacts our school counselors. Uh, the American School Counselor Association's Ethical Standards for School Counselors, 2010 version, highlighted uh, issues with developmental age, chronological age, uh, the setting, parental rights, and the nature of harm uh, when talking about disclosures. And in addition, the ASCA Ethical Standards for School Counselors directed school counselors to provide notice for students for the information uh, related to informed consent and confidentiality. Basically, our counselors are doing this. Starting in kindergarten, 
when they go and meet the classes, they're letting little kids and all of the students know there are certain things that if we talk about, I have to notify somebody about that. You can talk to me about issues, but if you tell me that somebody is hurting you or that you are gonna hurt yourself or that you have a plan to hurt somebody else, those are things that I have to report. This is putting something else on their plate that they have to report. We need to have a plan for how students are gonna have informed notification about that the same way they have informed notification about other things that counselors are required to report. I don't think we're ready to move forward with this. We've had a concern, areas of concerns expressed by uh, Ms. Linetti. We've received a detailed letter from the ACLU about their areas of concern. We have some work to do, and so therefore, I'll be standing on my principle, and I'll be voting no on this resolution, but I appreciate the time and effort that my colleagues have put into writing these resolutions. I know it's not easy, and I know that there's always people that are gonna pick apart each part of your wording, but thank you. Okay, we have one more speaker, but because I haven't had a chance to say anything, I'm gonna say something really quick. I know I, I, and you all know that I've been getting all kinds of emails saying, Miss Riggs, you said when the governor was, go governor put the model policy out, we would adopt it because we follow the law. And yes, I did. But let me say this, because I want it clear that um, we will implement them, but like Governor um, Northam's proposed policy in 2021, we'll implement them in a way that is appropriate for our division. And that's what I feel we need to be doing through the PRC. And I totally agree, totally, that parents need to be, no, they need to be told what's going on in their children's lives. I totally agree with that. But I also feel like we need to adopt the policies that work in our division for us and for, the, for everyone including parents and students. So I did want to make that statement. And I, I will not be voting for this policy as well. I think it should go to the PRC. And I know that Dr. Uh, Robertson and um, Mr. Jamison have worked very hard on trying to model the regulations and policies to follow the governor's model policy. Ms. Brown. Thank you. I am so happy um, to hear my colleagues um, supporting the rights of parental involvement um, after I was a citizen and, and did not hear that. So, um, you, you know, I, I hear, um, and I just want to go over a couple things. Um, not every district adopted the model policies. Just because another district decided to not follow the law doesn't mean that this division should do it. So I'm really glad that everybody is in agreement that we need to pass the model policies. And um, I believe that's what this resolution here says. It says we're gonna pass the model policies. So I would just urge my colleagues, if you support the model policies, to pass this. Um, if you do not support the model policies, don't pass it. Um, you know, the, the PRC is not um, a, a meeting that is broadcasted. There was a lot of good conversation in there. I feel like some of it's being overlooked um, here in this meeting today. Um, I feel like I heard pretty clearly from administration. Um, and, and, you know, actually, Madam Chair, I have a question. Um, for Dr. Robertson, if I can ask it. Um, Dr. Robertson, do you have a recommendation for the model policies? So we had developed uh, changes to several regulations based upon our interpretation of the model policies that I share with all the board members. Uh, Ms. Linetti came back on Monday, had made a revision to 571 that she shared 
that she felt was a stronger version of 571 than the version we had created. And she did the same with 544.2. Uh, and so that's as far as we got. And then, of course, and while all of that was going on concurrently, uh, a resolution was put forward in the second resolution. One resolution directed uh, we would take the sample model policies and implement those as written. And the substitute was we would look at a couple of different areas to be consistent with uh, the current policies. So that's the actions we had taken, uh, again, in preparation for being able to move quickly once the board made a decision. And um, I, I do agree. Um, initially, there was no um, crisis or emergency. There seemed to be an emergency with the PRC. Uh, you know, to the point that the model policies was moved with no agenda packet for me to even make a comment on in that meeting um, in place of, so it was an emergency then, but it is not an emergency now. Um, I support this. I want to give our administration direction. This is the direction I believe that they need to go forward, and um, I will be voting for it. Thank you. Um, Ms. Milnick. I just, I don't need to say this, but I'm just going to read this one paragraph again. The school board directs the superintendent or designee to replace the entire current regulation 571 with the 2023 model policies for Virginia Beach City Public Schools document attached to this resolution without modification no later than August 25th, which means that in by Friday, this is done with no modifications, period. So states the resolution. So... That's why I'm opposed to this, um, and I'm ready to vote. Mr. Culpepper. Uh, I've got one more question for the superintendent. Okay, so you just described a, a number of uh, regulations you had developed in preparation for this. Do you think any, any of them are in violation of uh, state law? When we developed the regulations, we, f we were confident the regulations were consistent with the new model policies. Okay. So you do think they're in violation of state law? No. With the new model policies. The regulations that we developed. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me rephrase the question. Okay. Do you think the regulations you developed violate state, federal uh, law, or the Human Rights Act? I think that there is a a bit of gray area no matter what we decide to do. And in, in our best faith effort, based upon our uh, understanding of the model policies, the direction we wanted to take, we were confident in the changes that we made were consistent with the model policies. Okay. Uh, so based on your best, your best faith and understanding of all those things uh, at the moment, in accordance with current policy 5.7, you would not be violating violating any previous resolution to implement those policies tomorrow, or those regulations rather. So, with that, there is the conflict of the previous resolution. Now, the previous the resolution told you not to violate law, the law. It didn't tell you in five seven no longer was in effect because it can't. It's a re it's a resolution, not a change of policy. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm relaying information that I got from our attorney that the uh, the previous resolution could be a uh, issue for changes okay. to the regulation. Am I, am I misstating the previous resolution? The previous resolution said we will not do anything in violation of the law or the Human Rights Act. So if we are not in violation, if your, reg if your regulations are not in violation of the law or Human Rights Act, then you don't need us to do anything. You can get going tomorrow. Can you repeat that, please? I'm just trying to point out the, you know, the stalemate we're creating here is unnecessary. They've developed regulations in accordance with their best faith, best faith understanding of the law and the Virginia Human Rights Act. We passed a resolution, was that back in June, that basically said we will not violate state or federal law or the Human Rights Act. So if those regulations do not violate law or the Human Rights Act, they don't need us to do anything. And they can get going tomorrow and start imp implementing the regulations as they, as, as they have written them. Okay. Ms. Anderson. Oh, she had had and for, sorry, I'll just. So just number one, they, they're not they're not able to go forward tomorrow. He's obligated to go forward tomorrow because it's a policy. He's obligated to act. 
You tried to cut me off. I tried Sorry. to talk around. I'll be fast. Yeah, I'll try to talk around. I'm going to be real fast. First of all, these are model policies, model policies that the governor has put out from VDOE. They're model policies. And just like in 2021, no school division got in trouble or lost money or was in violation of the law, as you might say, because they did not pass the regulations that were put out or the model policies put out in 2021. And so this is not law either. These are model policies. So let's get that clear. We're not in violation of anything if we don't pass this tonight. What we need to do is, in good faith, go through the PRC and implement policies that are in the spirit of this, but we need to be able to make modifications. And so one of the things that was pointed out here was this in the resolved without modification, no later than August 25th, 2023. Without modification, it means it ties our hands. We're stuck with exactly what the governor says. And honestly, he doesn't know what's best for Virginia Beach for our 65,000 students. He's, he's going for what he thinks is going to bring out his, his base of support for voters in November. And that's what he's really trying to do. That's what this is all about. Let's just be clear about it. It's a, it's a politics thing, and that's where I'm at. So I will not be supporting this because this is all politics, just trying to get a base of support out. Ms. Manning. Well, and Virginians elected Governor Yunkin for this very reason, if I'll just point that out. Um, I, I think it's imperative that we provide direction for Dr. Robertson tonight. I, I don't think that we should just say, oh, the resolution doesn't matter and he can just implement the, the policies and regulations. I, I don't think that's fair to him because he's had conflicting um, direction from this board. And, and, and I, I'm certain, I, I, I haven't talked to him about this, but I'm certain that he gets phone calls from all of us expressing our views that are very different. And I just, especially since he's new in this role, um, I, I think it's imperative that we vote on this and we provide him some direction. If this is voted down tonight, I, I feel really bad for Dr. Robertson. <laughs> so I hope that my colleagues will support this and support Governor Yunkin's model policies. Thank you. Okay. So no more people are in the, in the queue. So we are going to bring this to a vote. Okay. We've all said what we needed to say, I think, and it's time to vote. Um, so, the vote is we, um, Mrs. Manning's recommended resolution, okay, and we've all, it's, is it up on the board now, or is that? Yes, it is. Uh, that is the last part of Ms. Manning's resolution. Okay, so it's up on the board, and, um, we have a motion and we have it seconded, okay? So all that are in favor of Ms. Manning's resolution, please raise your hand. Ms. Martin, how do you vote? Vote no. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have five ayes. Okay, all that are against Ms. Manning's resolution, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have five nays. No. All that are abstain... Abstaining, please raise your hand. I am going to abstain just because I feel like I don't want to say that I don't want to incorporate the model policies, but I also feel like they're um, just like I did not vote in 2021 because of certain things that I felt concerned about. 
Um, I still have some concerns on this one, and I feel like there's still work to be done, so. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Madam Chair, we have five ayes, we have five nays, we have one abstention, so the motion did fail. Okay, all right, so we're going to move on, guys. So we are now on 16. You've got C. Oh, sorry, yes, I've got C. I'm sorry, my, my recommendation, I'm sorry. So my recommendation is to, um, I'm making the motion to fill the vacant at-large governance seat. Do I have a second? And it's with Kathleen Brown. Kathleen Brown seconded it. She raised her hand. <laughs> okay. Um, all that are in favor of that recommendation for the at-large governance seat, please raise your hand. Ms. Martin, how do you vote? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have 11 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. That should put you at 15D, which was the amended motion to Mrs. Manning's motion to amend the agenda to Jake um, all administrative appointments other than the meeting communication appointments and vote on that. Did I say that? I'm sorry, did I say that correctly, Mrs. Manning? Yeah. Okay. So we have... Point of order. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know if this is the time, but I, I did whisper in Ms. Linetti's ear about my intentions. When you are on the one, <laughs> one side of a vote, you may bring it back, but we've got some time limitations. In, in our previous vote, where we voted on the communications person, I wish that Dr. Um, Robertson would have shared this before we voted, because in hindsight, I don't want to leave the school system crippled, and his words, without a communication person. So I would like to add 15E, so that, may be, that might do something with 15D, um, 15E, that we appoint Tiffany Russell to this position with um, Dr. Robertson going back to her and giving him the ability to negotiate her contract. May I um, express a point of order? Sure. Um, I think the appropriate way to do this is to have a motion and a second, and then you can amend the motion. Uh, I'm not, all right. I'm not sure she's looking to amend the your motion. I think she's adding another item separate about this. OK, that's fine. To keep it separate. Right now, the motion on the floor is to amend your agenda to add 15E to deal with that specific position. And then you can just vote on Mrs. Manning's motion. She's jumping ahead on an agenda, okay. trying to get an agenda item on. I'll second that. I was going to second it, but go ahead. So the motion on the floor is 15E, which is Mrs. Mrs. Weems' motion to amend your agenda, add 15E to vote on appointing Tiffany Russell as a media communication director with some negotiation on the salary. So all you're doing right now is amending the agenda to put that on after you deal with Mrs. So that's Manning's all the vote is for, okay? Right. Uh, okay. Mrs. Manning's motion, it's, it's a little awkward. It's a point of order at this point just to add that one on because she thought it might be relevant to what you want to do with Mrs. Manning's motion. Okay, so we need to vote for an E, okay? No, 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 the motion's on the floor is the to amend floor, your agenda to bring, job. you're not voting on this, it's just to add this. Just she wants you to it. know while you're voting on this that she would like you to vote afterwards. That's all right, so all that are in favor of adopting putting E yes. to come after D, please raise your hand. Ms. Martin, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. Okay, all that are against, please raise your hand. And we have one nay, so the motion to amend the agenda did pass. Okay. Now you go back to 15D, which is Mrs. 15D. Manning's motion about the other positions. Okay, so 15D. Um, 
separate to amend the agenda to include the no. adoption no. of all the no, no, no. you're no. just on the motion just on the motion I make a motion that we accept the personnel report and administrative appointments um, without the media and communications department yes okay that's it do we have a second Owens. okay miss uh, Owen seconded and all in favor please raise your hand Ms. Martin, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have 11 ayes. The motion did pass. Okay. So now we're going to go to E. All right. Um, make your motion. My yes. motion is to appoint Tiffany Russell to the media and communications position with um, the authority given to our superintendent to negotiate her contract. Do And I have a second. Can I get some, I, I'm sorry, I, I know I was helping you with the motion, clarification, what happens if a point and if she's agreeable to a salary, does it need to come back to you? How do you want him to handle this? If she doesn't agree, she, you don't want a point or she's not going to agree to that salary. So if she's agree, did you want to say a point if she's agreeable to a salary, but how do you want um, Dr. Robertson to handle talking with you about that? Well, I don't think that we can really throw numbers out there right now. You want to move this to closed session? Yeah, that. Do you want to try to go to closed session tonight? I, okay, we're eleven oh nine. I don't know if the candidate is available. He might have to go up, but but we could talk about it in closed session if he wanted to. But I don't know if he has time doing the time of the night where he can call that person and negotiate a salary. But he probably needs to talk to human resources too. So I'm not. You're putting him in a little bit of a difficult position. How much discretion do you want to give him as far as negotiating? Now, maybe that's your discussion. Maybe you have it in there and have a discussion a little bit, and then you might amend that emotion. I just, I'm just not sure it's clear to him what he needs to do. If he's got to do something tonight, he's got to get on the phone and start talking. Right. Well, I mean, obviously, the best place for it is a closed session, which I don't have any trouble discussing that in closed. Do you want to move this about. to closed session to mm -hmm. talk about what you're willing to and give him some direction? So can we yeah. vote on, can you... Amend your yes. My my motion is to appoint Tiffany Russell as communications and media director. Okay. Media and communications with the ability to negotiate the con the contract and to discuss details of the contract in closed session tonight. Okay. So do I have a second for that? Second. Okay, Miss uh, Franklin. I'm sorry, I'm, I hate I'm to do this to you. Can we, can we change the motion to say you would offer the position it, pending your negotiation? Because otherwise you've appointed her, but then you don't know what the salary is. So it, it, how about you offer it to her pending a closed session discussion about the salary? Okay, I would like to clearer? amend my motion and to substitute a point with the word offer. Okay, seconded by Mrs. Melnick. All right, everybody, is everybody clear? I, Ms. I'm really not because this tells yeah. me that we're offering the position to her and um, that was voted down. And so are we, are, are we voting to offer her the position contingent upon, are we gonna take another vote later? I, I don't. If, I'm wondering whether the motion is to go to closed session and discuss it and then come out I, and decide, because I'm not sure I, you're clear what you want to do. Can I move that we table this until after closed session to vote after closed session? Well, or the other thing is just move, we asked to move it to close. Could we take it up in closed session so you yeah, can have that, a further discussion? My, that's what my tabling it until after closed session means. Yep, that's fine. Do I need to withdraw my amendment? I mean, you would mind. just like us to add it to the closed session call yes. and we can decide afterwards what to do with it. I think that's, yes. if that's acceptable, maybe that might be a better, that'll, be, that'll give you some opportunity to figure out exactly what you want to say. Yeah. Do you want to talk? All right, Ms. Brown. Yeah, so I just want to add some clarity. Um, I have no intentions of asking um, Dr. Robertson to call anybody at 11.15 at night. Um, I do have some some questions, um, and I think those can be cleared up in closed session, and I think that we can all move forward in a way that's best for the division. Thank you. Uh, I would want him to call me, I have to say that. Uh, this is a move for this person uh, from one position in a different 
company, different entity to us, I would think she would want to know. I would want to know. So. Well, I think he, she needs to know about what's happened. And give him direction. Okay. So How about we give him direction. It's up in closed session. We're kind of getting into some personnel matters. Right. Yeah. Okay. So now we need to, do we, do we need to vote on this again? Yeah, right, to get it to. I can just add it to the call for closed session okay. and we'll d That's take right. it up there. We'll add to the call and clarify it there. And then okay, so we don't need to, to vote on this. No, you just can just pick up as an action after closed session if you, you've come to some conclusion what you want to do. Gotcha. Okay, so I think we're on 16. <coughs> I just have a question for clarification. Mrs. Manning, um, it was the vote for to accept the personnel report without the communications position, correct? So would Dr. Robinson have to make his announcement for those appointments other than that one? Yes. Yeah, because he... Order. Okay, thank you. So, Dr. Robertson. So, thank you, uh, members of the board. Uh, tonight, I'm pleased that you've approved our recommendation for Heather Schuler, currently an administrative assistant at White Oaks, to be the new assistant principal at, at uh, Windsor Oaks Elementary School. Next, I'm, I'm pleased that you've approved our recommendation for Marcus Turner, currently an assistant principal at Larkspur Middle School, to be the new assistant principal at Cox High School. And then finally, I'm pleased that you've, rec you've approved our recommendation of Andrea Kearney, currently a behavior intervention specialist in the Office of Student Support Services, to be a coordinator in, as a behavior intervention specialist, a coordinator of behavior intervention services in the Office of Student Support Services. Thank you. Okay. So we are now on committee organization and board reports. Do we have any reports? Uh, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. uh, I just want to say I attended the last SEAC meeting, but I'll send an email to the board to brief them on what, was, what we discussed. Okay. I, I do want to make an um, announcement with Sister Cities. Um, I have been the representative, the liaison for school board for the, since I've been on the board for six years, six and a half years. Um, I am going to step down as the liaison. Bev has been the alternate for the last four years. And so Bev is going to step up and be the liaison. Uh, I'm going to step down that, from that now. I actually, I think that's an appointment. It's going to be an appointment, but I do want to make that an announcement and let people know that uh, we'll vote on it the next meeting. Because um, I just think that I do not want to hurt Sister Cities and my integrity on that board. On the lia as the liais liaison has been questioned by someone in the public, and I do not want to hurt it. All right, I'll explain it. That, um, the school system was foiled by a citizen about me going to Germany and how it was paid for. Now, I need to explain this to everyone because you all need to know. And maybe the citizen is still listening. I don't know. But I was going as the liaison, and I was the chair of the Germany committee. <laughs> the Hampton Roads Alliance was going to look at the workforce development. And because we have a sister city called Weiblingen, Germany, which is right in the Stuttgart um, section of Germany, I was meeting with the mayor for Weiblingen, for our sister cities, along with our president, um, Maria Weissenseel. And when the Hampton Roads Alliance found out that I was the um, school board chair, they were like, oh, this is great. You can come and see what's going on with our conference and visit 
all of the places we're going to take all of the mayors for the Hampton Roads Alliance and see what they do in Germany with their, their um, workforce development with their students. And you can bring it back. I'm like, oh, that's great. You know, I can kill two birds with one stone. Now, it was questioned how it was paid for by the citizen, my trip. My trip was being paid for by me. The only thing that was paid for by sister cities, which they do for every representative that goes and visits a sister city, was my flight and two nights stay. The rest of it I was paying for, including my husband. He was going with me. So when I said, I guess it wasn't meant to be, to be that I didn't get to go because the airline kept me from going, I guess it wasn't meant to be. But I do not want to bring any bad <laughs> vibes or bad light onto sister cities. All the cities who went, all the mayors went. And I think Dr. Robertson got to meet with our mayor and he was so excited. I haven't been able to hear what the, uh, the report was, but it apparently was very successful and it was very good and they're excited about some things hopefully that we will be able to do and they'll share it with our Workforce Development Committee. And, and the person that set this whole trip up was, he's the, the um, husband of Sister City's president and his name is Gunther Weissensiel. He is the CEO of IMS Gear, and he's German, and he, he was trained over there, and that's you know, how he knows he needs workforce in his company, and he's like wanting our cities to see this so we can maybe model and work towards helping our students get the same advantage that the students over in Germany do. And he's on our workforce. Yeah, and he's on the workforce committee with um, Gunther, Gunther uh, Weissens Hill is. So it was a really good opportunity. But I just want everyone to know that no one, no one on the, the school board was not paying for anything. But the school board has paid for sister city representatives to go in the past. Uh, Mrs. Carolyn Garrett went many years ago when Ireland uh, to visit Ireland. And she was a principal at Arrowhead. But no, um, no, no money was coming from the school board or the school system. I just want everybody to know that. So I am, I'm going to step down. We'll vote on that at the next meeting. But I did want to, to share that because I think everybody needs to know that because that, that has been questioned. Okay? So thank you. Ms. Brown, did you have something? Okay. Closed okay, so now we're going to go to closed session. Um, so can you read, read out? I move the school board recess into closed session in accordance with the expectations to open meetings law set forth in Code of Virginia 2.2-3711, Part A, Paragraph 178, as amended to deliberate on the following matters. One, discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, discipline, and resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body and evaluation of performance or departments of schools of public institutions of higher education, where such evaluation will necessarily involve discussion of the performance of specific individuals. Seven, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation, where such consultation or briefing is open meeting, in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. For the purposes of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or on which the body, public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable basis to believe will be commenced by or against a known party. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter. Eight, consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted in a matter, namely to discuss A, acting superintendent's goals, B, hearing date for petition 
for revocation of teaching license, C, status of pending litigation or administrative cases, D, settlement offer in pending class action matter, E, hiring of outside counsel for certain pending litigation, F, consultation with legal counsel regarding probable litigation and pending litigation matters, and G, discussion regarding appointment of a specific administrator. Second. Okay, all in favor to go into closed session, please raise your hand. Okay. So we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass. All right. We are going into closed session. We have 10 minutes to go to the restroom, whatever you need to do. pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the City of Virginia Beach hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification applies. And only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. I need a second. Did you move second. that? Mm -mm. No, I, I, mo I moved. Okay, you moved, Ms. Melnick. I made a second. And you're seconded, Ms. Anderson. All in favor, please raise your hand. You moved. Come out of close. Okay, Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass for certification of closed. We're out of closed, and now I'm going to make the motions that we need to make, okay, or that we need to pass. One, the school board attorney and the chair of, or Dr. Robertson are authorized to take actions to accept the settlement terms in the Altria class action suit. Do I have a motion? Okay, moved by Ms. Weems, seconded by Mrs. Um, Franklin. All in favor, please raise your hand. We have 10 ayes. The motion passed. Okay, the second. That the school board attorney is authorized to retain outside legal counsel for certain pending litigation matters. Do I have a motion for that? Mm -hmm. Ms. Um, Owens and seconded by Mrs. Anderson. All in favor, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass. Okay. And the final one. That the school board will hold a hearing on September 26, 2023 for the petition for revocation of collegiate teaching license num number CP353500J. DuPont and the chair and the school board attorney are authorized to make arrangements for such a hearing. Do I have a motion? Yes, Ms. Franklin and seconded by Mrs. Melnick. All in favor, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion passed. Okay, and now we are adjourned. <laughs>